welcome to Hollywood Blockbusters. I am your host, Joe Hollywood. And once again, I am joined by Imaginos Pete. Hey, hey. Andrew Walker. Hey. And joining us once again is George Johnson. Yes. Hello. Now, one could argue that movies are a time travel device. Uh, time periods are caught on film. And after that, we can go back and revisit those films as often, as often as you want and takes you back to the sinking of the Titanic or the Old West. Um, and so that's, that's why movies are so beloved by me is that, you know, you, you can escape from this current time period and go back and relive any time period from the past or the future. Oh, yeah. And so movies are like a, a, a time capsule, a time machine. So that is going to be our theme today is, is uh, time travel movies. And uh, as I did my research on this, I found out there are quite a few time travel movies. As we were talking about it in the office, everyone was really you know skeptical. Like, how many time travel movies are there? There are a lot many, of time many. travel movies. Some are better than others. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, like most genres take like the zombie genre um i enjoy a good zombie movie but you kind of get tired of the same old formula so i prefer movies that kind of put a unique spin on a specific genre and the same is true for time travel movies i like to see someone do something a little different with the genre um and so that's what you're going to see on my list i've created a list of my top 10 favorite uh time travel movies uh, with some honorable mentions, and I'm sure our lists will overlap, and uh, and we can all comment on any one of these titles. Uh, so, of course, I'm going to start off with I what I feel is the gold standard of time travel movies, and uh, that is Back to the Future uh, yes. came out. And now, now you might be thinking the whole <laughs> yeah. the whole franchise. Well, the sequels to a lesser extent, but for me. The first Back to the Future movie that came out in 1985 uh, is a perfect movie, and I I vividly uh, have a memory of going to the theater, seeing it with family, not knowing what to expect. I I remember thinking, oh that that guy from ba or from uh, Family Ties is in this movie, <laughs> and uh, so I went and I I came out of that theater a changed person. Uh, I had never seen anything like it, uh, adventure and fun and laughs and. And this movie kind of set the standard for time travel where other branches are created due to changes in either the past or future. And that's an interesting thing we'll talk about today, too, are the, the different interpretations of time travel. Like some movies say it's just a, a linear path, and if you make a change here, it makes a change here. But then movies like Back to the Future are once you make that change you create a brand new path so we'll kind of talk about that a little bit too um but back to the future uh was just so great and it was inspired um by uh, bob gale who was flipping through his father's high school yearbook and and thought well i wonder what it was like to be his buddy to be his pal and that was kind of the the seed for back to the future and no studio wanted to touch it because of its strange storyline about his mom in the past falling in love with Marty McFly um, until <laughs> Steven Spielberg stepped in and said, uh, Universal, were, take yeah. a shot at, at this. Uh, there were a couple of things. In that. I think Netflix <laughs> did that series behind the film of the films that made us. And they originally when they did it, they were talking about a nuclear explosion needed to power it. And it yeah. was going to be a bathtub. Or, or like it a was a refrigerator, refrigerator, refrigerator in the back of a pickup truck. That's how they were going to move it around. And there was a monkey involved. Uh, he was, yeah, there <laughs> might have been a monkey, a monkey at one so point. This, uh, what could yeah. have been? <laughs> so, yeah, I could see what, along with the whole, yeah, you know, yeah. kissing your mom. Now, I exchanged emails with Bob Gale, who was a co-writer with uh, the director, Bob Zemeckis, on the film. And, and he, wow. we talked about some of that stuff, about the origins of the time machine and what it was going to be. And they were afraid that if they made uh, the time machine a refrigerator, that kids playing Back to the Future would be <laughs> locking themselves in old refrigerators. And they thought, maybe that's not the best idea. And so the DeLorean, which I think... Uh, DeLorean Motor Company at this point had gone out of business. Um, and so, or maybe, maybe it wasn't out of business yet, no. but they, 
they worked out a deal with John DeLorean. He donated, uh, you know, a couple of DeLoreans for the film, and that gave that car new life. And today, it would probably be a footnote or forgotten if it wasn't for Back to the Future, making this one of the most iconic uh, movie cars in history. Um, I have a friend that uh, built one, basically. He took a stock DeLorean and put all the little doodads the in flux gizmos capacitor. on a flux capacitor. I have a flux <laughs> capacitor He's at home. He's got one Fluxing. in the office. That's right. <laughs> so as, finicky. as you could imagine, the, the movie and its sequels have had a huge impact on me. Uh, I've met most of the cast. I, I collect the Hot Wheels. I have most of the signatures. Michael J. Fox I just met last year. Leah Thompson, Tom Wilson. Um, it's it's had a huge impact on me and is one of my top five all-time favorite movies ever. What are your guys' thoughts on Back to the Future as a time travel movie and uh, as, a, as a movie I in general? It. I loved it. I, it was part of my childhood growing up. I couldn't get enough of it. I like the fact that it had the most simplistic un- explanation of time travel compared to Terminator and other uh, other yeah. franchises, and yet because it's a comedy, it doesn't have to be airtight when it comes to the butter. You know, all everything that Doc was saying, I'm like, yeah, Doc, but if we're really going to nitpick this, that shouldn't happen. That shouldn't. Happen. But it's comedy. Once you say comedy, you get so much leeway. You know, there's a term in the film industry called a MacGuffin, yeah. and it's something that sort of drives the story along and. You could say that in this movie, the flux capacitors, the MacGuffin, we don't necessarily need to know how it works. I mean, Doc does a little explanation, but really, you don't have to get into the science of it. You don't have to spend too much time explaining. It's like, here's how it works. Now, let's go back in time. Let's just get to the action. And I think movies that try to over-explain how this all works fail at doing that. Um, Just say, okay, here's the flux capacitor. Let's go. So, yeah, yeah, I mean that has it, it's iconic soundtrack, iconic sound effect. You could play the sound effect of the DeLorean. <laughs> People are like I know what that is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, just the uh, the uh, door opening and the uh, the time when it turns on, and, yeah, and not starting and all that stuff. All iconic and uh, introduced uh, a movie going audience I mean, to a lot of. Let's things. put it this way: when when the movie Ready Player One came out, when he when the main character brings his car out and it's a DeLorean, people started losing their minds. <laughs> right? They're like, "It's the DeLorean!" And I'm like, "Wow, you kids weren't even alive when this movie was made." Yeah, fair enough. Now, <laughs> Back to the Future Two, that's when Marty goes into the future, which is now our past, which blows my mind. We're almost ten years past the time that Marty and Doc went into the future, which is crazy. We now know how the people in Back to the Future felt because they were like, 1985, oh my God. And they were born in 1950s. They're like, look at what they're talking about the 80s. Yeah, and we never did get the flying cars. Now, I I do love Back to the Future too, even though I think it takes a very, very dark turn where Biff has George murdered and marries (laughs) uh, Lorraine and, and... she Smacks said breast or, implants. Or, yeah, so like, it goes from being a family a family show to yeah. being like, what are it we went watching? Really, it was really dark. dark. It went dark. And it I know with a lot of chapter. trilogies and a lot of just stories in general, that mi- middle chapter always tends to be a little dark. They did it with the Raider series, and it uh, went Empire uh, Strikes Back a little on there. Yeah, didn't it? it went a little yeah. dark. <laughs> yeah. So, it, I, as much as I love Back to the Future Two, it, it went a little too dark for me. The third one hardly feels like a time travel movie it feels just like a flat out western if we were talking if we were doing a podcast about westerns i'd be talking about back to the future three i wish three would have been more on like really seeing what the time machine was capable of and taking us back to dinosaurs and and medieval times and stuff like that and instead of just being stuck in one genre for the entire length of the film i think they read your mind and did that with the back to the future cartoon series, yeah, the series and the, and the yeah. ride where they go back into the dinosaur level. yeah because this was just about rescuing doc you gotta yeah get him back. yeah <laughs> yeah so uh, the, the third one i enjoy but it, it's just a flat out western now one cool thing that happened to me back in 1990s, uh, my aunt and uncle, uh, I was living in California at the time, and my aunt and uncle said, you want to go to Universal Studios? And I said, yeah, sure. So we went, we did the tram thing. I'm riding along on the tram. We turn a corner, and we're in Hill Valley. 
the, oh. the DeLorean is parked there. Hill Valley is standing there, the clock tower. And they told us that they had filmed the sequels back to back and that the set was still up from the two sequels. And That's kind of your own little time travel yeah. moment. Because yeah. you're, you're going back. I was in Hill Valley. Yeah. Good gracious, did you lose it or what? <laughs> it was amazing. And at the time, they really weren't generous about allowing us to take photos, even though I have since uh, found videos and photos of that time period at Universal Studios. I wish I had videos of me on that tour. And at one point, I got called. Uh, that we, we disembarked from the tram, and they do do a little demonstration of uh, special effects. And they're like, how, here's how we did some of the special effects in uh, Back to the Future. And they go, we need a volunteer. My hand goes up. <laughs> I get called. I, t- I go backstage, and they put a white lab coat on me, put a crazy wig on me. They, they hook up a little safety uh, cable to me. They go stand on the sledge. I'm now standing on the clock tower ledge with the concrete gargoyles on either side of me. I mean, obviously, I was only, you know, 15 feet off the ground or whatever. But here's the, the tram people looking up at me on the ledge trying to connect the cable. I get struck by a lightning, and the platform I'm on spins, and I'm, I get turned into a skeleton. Um, but as a fan That's of Back to cool. the Future, to see what <laughs> my camera just died on me. Um, being a fan of Back to the Future, to, to see Hill Valley in person, to experience what is like being Doc Brown on a ledge. Uh, that was one of the greatest days of my life. Wait, wait, really wait, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute. Did you connect the wires? <laughs> I don't, th- I think they had them just Come too on, short. Come on, uh, Great you couldn't, Scott. You couldn't even tie them? No, they no? were. Oh. Uh, 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 and so. Dang I, it, Joe. I, I Marty sure. needed that. <laughs> so the thing that always strikes me about Back to the Future is what you talked about earlier, the, the MacGuffin, and that is the car. Yeah. Um, I think if it had been a, a, a fridge in the back of a truck <laughs> or whatever, there's something about having to go 88 miles an hour. Yeah. I can't tell you how many times I'm in the car. I've been in a station wagon doing 88, and I'm like, we're going back in time, baby. <laughs> And um, now here's I, an interesting tidbit about that. The De- the street version of the DeLorean, its speedometer only went up to like 70 or 75 or something. <laughs> so they had to get the art department to create new speedometers that said 90 or whatever so that they can say we're at 88. Now, a common question that Bob Gale gets is why 88? And he goes, it's just an easy number to remember. I love it. Instead of saying, you know, cool 76 or 93 or whatever. 88 was just a number to remember. There's no other significance. Everybody it. remembers that number. And the, yeah. the thing about the, the the flux capacitor is Doc Brown, he does sit in it with Marty, and he says, and he's punching the buttons, he says, look, you go back to the time of Christ. You could go back to oh, yeah, and he the Oh, yeah, and he types Romans. in 0, yeah. one, zero, zero. And, of course, everybody knows that that's highly debatable. <laughs> but, um, but he does, you can, to me, it was like, this could this car could be used for all kinds of nefarious purposes. Oh yeah, and Which he Biff could does. go back to Christ time, mm-hmm. but instead he is going back <laughs> to the fifties, and which was an accident, really. Which yeah. was an accident, exactly. Yeah. And time, he had just left it there by accident. Go ahead. Wasn't that the time? Because that's when he said that day. Because that I, that's, that's when, when I, he. Came that's up the with day the I idea. bumped my head yeah. in the bathtub and and yeah. thought of the flux capacitor. Yeah. And I love the fact that. He explains everything. A, he basically says in so many words, we're not going back to the time of Christ because that's the first thing everybody wants. Let's go back to see Christ or maybe Hitler or something like that. Yeah, no, yeah. he doesn't do that. Yeah. So it's more realistic. And I, and when I go into a time travel type of a scenario, I think to myself, are they going to go see Christ? Are they going to go back? Because, I mean, that's what... And, and it's it's in the back of your mind. Yeah. So when he doesn't, it's like, oh, thank God. I don't have to worry about <laughs> yeah. it. This that can just be, be a, a fun movie. Yeah. Yeah. It would be too much. Or dinosaurs... Yeah. You know, it's fine. Uh, Ray Bradbury, I think, has a thing where he goes back in time and he steps on the butterfly and he comes back and everything's changed in the future. Yeah. 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 You know what's interesting? In Back to the Future and some of the other time travel movies we'll talk about today, that number that they travel is always kind of a nice, neat, round number. In Back to the Future, 
they go back 30 years. In the sequel, they go forward 30 years. In Looper, it's 30 years. It's always like a nice, neat number. It's never like, hey, let's go to the future 17 years. Well, let's years talk about now. it right now. We could go back 30 years. We'd be in the 90s. It's something we're all familiar with. We wouldn't be like, oh, I know where not to go and what not to do here. Isn't let's go see Forrest Gump. Think that- <laughs> I think that they use 30 because it's an easy way of saying, in sitting in the, in the audience eating popcorn, I can just subtract 10 decades. Yeah, exactly. So I, it's easy for me to go, okay, 2024, 2014, 2004, 1994. Yeah. Oh, I know exactly what it was in 1994. Rather than going 26 years, oh, forget it. I just forget it, you know. It's easy for us to, to remember. Yeah. Now, isn't it crazy to think that when I was sitting in the theater in 1985, 1955 seemed like an eternity. Like it <laughs> was a different, weird time. Yeah. yeah. But like you just said, 30 years from today is 1994. Oh, which, yeah, yeah, you were closer to that, 55 back then. Isn't that That's right. nuts? Than, than today. That, isn't that crazy? That 95 yeah. would be such... If you took an 18-year-old teenager who went back in time 30 years in the 90s, they would be lost and confused. Where's Where's the internet? Where's my phone? <laughs> it's weird to think that... Yeah, phones on the wall I, I, <laughs> right. I, need, cash. I need cash to, 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 to transact <laughs> yeah. business wait what that's phone. right that, it's it's crazy to think that 95 is the equivalent of 55 in back to the future so andrew did you want to yeah. add anything to back to the future yeah um so just like with star wars i saw I, okay i saw empire strikes back first when i was a kid i saw back to the future two first oh, that was the first wow. one i saw that's so, so odd to me. I know, I know. So that those two movies are my favorites in those trilogies. And I, I as a kid, I was probably eight, probably seven or eight when I saw Back to the Future 2. And I, I'm like, whoa, you can go into the future? You know, <laughs> as a kid seeing it that young, that was, that was amazing yeah. that yeah. he went to 2015, you know? And, yeah. then, and then later on in the movie, he briefly goes back to... 1955, right? Yeah, so there's like yeah. two Martys running around yeah, in 1955. Yeah. And I'm like, wait, what's going on? And then when I saw the first one, I'm like, oh, this makes a little more sense yeah, now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I bet it would. Um, it was a, that movie was a bit prophetic, though, right? Because in one way, you had Jaws 19. I was like, yeah, they would make sequels like that if they could make, yeah. if they could make there, it. There are things they got right, and there are things they were way off on. And, if, and they knew at the time when they made uh, the, the sequel that they weren't going to have flying cars, but they were going to have fun with it in the film. Mm-hmm. But the other thing that makes me laugh is thinking that the facts would, would be so popular in 2015 when and you get the, the fired f- when you're back. With the like you, you're going to oh, be still yeah. printing things. It looked like a dot matrix <laughs> printer too at that. I said, yeah. what, what's a dot <laughs> matrix printer doing? Yeah. So they were so impressed with the fax technology, they thought, yeah, it'll be here in 2015. And the, but and but if you think of it, the surrogate, the fax <laughs> is kind of the surrogate for the internet. Like, it's right. faster, it's more yes. connected, it's immediate. Yeah. But that is one thing they did nail, are the big screen, picture in picture, all that stuff, Zoom. They yep. they nailed all that they stuff. They did. Yeah. They did. They really did. Makes you wonder yeah. how they did their research. Now I'm kind of curious. I want to say, what did you guys, did you guys talk to DARPA before you did this movie? Like, what's going on here? <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting you say that, and this kind of fits into our time travel theme. Now, I don't know if you guys have ever heard this, but there was a guy... Uh, I don't know if it was the 60s or 70s or something, working on a portable phone. And he, he got it to like, you know, the size of a brick, you know, a loaf of bread. And he's like, I got to make this smaller. I got to make this smaller. And so he was a Star Trek fan and he's watching oh. Star Trek cast members, you know, on their, their intercoms and they, you know, and flip. And they're like, that's it. That was the model. So being a Star Trek fan, he wanted the portable phone to eventually look like the Star Trek phone, which is the uh, it, the flip phone that you know Nokia kind of predated yeah, the exactly. iPhone. Or was it the Nextel one with the commercial? You could just flip it. Yeah, yeah. Right, where are you? Yeah. So think about this. Back in the '60s, when Gene Roddenberry and the and the 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 crew and everything of Star Trek are trying to predict the future, they're like, "Well, everyone will probably have a little you know flip communicator." Well, here they are trying to predict the future. They caused the future. Sure. They caused flip phones to ah. look like the communicators in Star Trek. <clears throat> that blows my mind. Yeah. That's pretty awesome. I think, I think with a lot of sci-fi things, you have a lot of just really intelligent people who 
kind of see the writing on the wall. Yeah. I mean, think of all the sci-fi from the 60s about aircraft and stuff before we even went to the moon and or spacecraft and all yeah. that things. And I I think a lot of this stuff you kind of you kind of can predict a little bit, but I mean not not to a 100% de- yeah. degree, but I think I think a lot of it's Yeah. Well, if, easy. if you talk to the guys that actually created the technology behind all of that and you say what was your favorite show they're going to say star trek oh, yeah, they're going to really say influenced them, yeah. you know they're going to yep. say mission impossible where they're creating gadgets and you know those tower james bond and stuff yep. yeah and it's interesting because people are, are are making jokes or they're saying you know you've got a phone in your shoe like, you <laughs> or maxwell smart yeah yeah but you have this whole generation of people growing up going wait why isn't that that way yeah. why can't we do that you know what's interesting is is when Apple introduced the iPad, I remember seeing it and going, why would people want to go bigger? We have iPhones. Why do we want to go iPads? Of course, they were enormously popular. And then watching an old episode of Star Trek The Next Generation, you got Dr. Crusher yep. walking around with an, what's essentially an, an iPad, iPad in her head. Yep. Yeah. Years before that, I'm like, of course, they nailed it. And I was like, who wants an iPad? So, yeah, I'm not going to be getting rich off my inventions anytime Don't soon. worry, Joe. You're not alone. I had to eat a little crow. In, in Back <laughs> to the Future 2, 2015, the Cubs win the World Series. Who would have thought in 2016 they win the They game missed World. it by one wow. year. What? That's 2016, the Cubs missed it by one year. That's impressive. And I, was in the, I used to laugh. I'm like, hey, where's your World Series, fellas? <laughs> oh, the God. very it next happened. year. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty impressive. Do you think that behind the, the doors in 2015, they're just bawling their eyes out going, we were told that this was good. We got to get it next year, guys. We got to get it. Yeah. <laughs> now, you know what? On on the actual date that uh, Marty travels to the future in 2015, it was like, I want to say it was like October 22nd, 2015, something like that. Uh, USA Today released a special Back to the Future newspaper that had the same pictures, articles, uh, you know, all this stuff. But they had to make some minor changes to it because they they got some things wrong. If you look closely at like a still from the movie of the newspaper, you'll see a little tiny headline off to the side that makes reference to Queen Diana. And so oh, when they released the yeah. uh, the actual newspaper, which I have several of at home, they removed the reference to Queen Diana and replaced it with something else. But just about everything else is accurate in there. As a matter of fact, they have a huge full page ad for Jaws 19 or whatever yeah. in there. So <laughs> it was really cool that USA Today did that, like released a real life copy that you can hold in your hands. That's pretty cool. I'd love to see that, by the way. Yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty neat. You know, and you're you're talking about stuff. Uh, Andrew was talking about you know stuff that they could be predicting, especially in the military. I just saw that article where they said, "Hey, we just drone tested our first F-16." I went, "Why? Have you guys <laughs> not seen Terminator? Why yeah. is this air military aircraft flying?" You're like, "Well, it has a pilot seat. And like, you won't need it." Yeah, when you start hearing about AI and all this stuff, you're oh, like, yeah. "Why, people? Skynet. Don't you watch these movies?" Skynet. Bo- Boston Robotics has that big four-legged like dog, and they're like, "Now we just put a gun on its back." I'm like, "Okay, yeah. fine." Yeah, it's you over. see the dog with the flamethrower. <laughs> yeah. Oh no! <laughs> yeah, the and then you see thing. like yeah. these scientists. You're like, "Watch this!" And they like kick it over, and it's like, "You're making it angry. <laughs> Don't kick it." And I keep thinking of Jeff Goldblum's character, Dr. Malcolm. Before you knew what you had, you, you, you patented it, and you patched it, and now you're selling it, and you're selling it. And you you well ask done. yourself <laughs> you ask yourself what what's the the quote uh, you ask you yourself if you could but yeah, you, you should ask, ask if you should, you should. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. just yeah, because we can doesn't mean we should, should. exactly yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah and that's what they say with AI but uh, but we can't stop progress I'm like you actually can you can just literally work on something else just take a break step back <laughs> go see a movie yeah not Terminator. <laughs> or maybe you should see Terminator oh, yeah. so you can see how it ends. Yeah, I'm like, come on, guys. It's smiling at you, but it's not a smile. Yeah. All right, moving on to the next movie on my list at number two, my all-time favorite movie list. Uh, this is a movie that um, doesn't necessarily have someone traveling backward or forward in time. It's basically someone living the same day over and over and over. We're talking uh-huh. about Groundhog Day. 1993, Bill Murray, Andy McDowell, directed by one of my all-time favorite people, Harold Ramis, Harold one Ramis. of the funniest yes. people on the planet. Uh, he also wrote it. And uh, now, here's something people might not be aware of. Years before Groundhog Day, I remember sitting there looking for something to watch. I was uh, probably in my, what was it? I was, I was in my 20s, I think, 24 or so. 
I found a short film called 1201 PM and it stars Kurt Wood Smith, who was the father on that 70s yep. show. And he was in RoboCop. Uh, he plays a character who uh, the, the short starts off with him sitting on a bench, eating a lunch. A woman comes up and says, uh, I have a great lunch you have there. And he says, doesn't matter. I'm going to be hungry in an hour again. Anyways, she's like, what? Well, you find out that he's living the same hour over and over and over again. And he only has an hour to try and find out why this is happening before he's returned to the bench. And um, so when Groundhog Day did it, it, it wasn't an entirely original concept. I think there had been other projects that were sort of similar with these time loops. But Groundhog Day, I think, did it best. Uh, years later, there's a movie called Palm Springs on Hulu with Andy Samberg that yeah. had the similar concept of living the same wedding day over and over and over again. Um, but Groundhog Day was equal parts comedy, tragedy, romance. It had everything going yeah. for it. And watching Bill Murray go through like every stage of grief and denial and acceptance and all this stuff, um, it's to me, it transcends a movie. It's it's like philosophical. Like it's really amazing to watch Bill Murray's character go through all that until apparently the universe feels that he's finally gotten it right and yeah. he finally wins Andy McDowell at the very end. And now a, a common question that you see online or Reddit or whatever is how many days did Bill Murray's character experience? How many days did he did he live over and over again? Now there are people who watch the movie and every time a scene starts over again, or he wakes up to, I got you, babe, they, they check off a number or whatever. And they take a shot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> and so in the movie itself, I can't remember what the number is, but it's like, let's say it's 80 something times he relives. They're like, well, you're, you're not factoring in the fact that he learns to play piano, the piano. Yes. He, he's sculpted. well read. He becomes an ice carver. Uh, he develops all these skills. And, and so then, you, you factor all the story time. of all the people in the town, everybody. He and knows he knows everybody. everybody. And that, that final day before he moves on, you know, he, he catches the kid falling out of the tree, and he saves the guy from choking, and he does all this on that final day. Was it thirty three years? I've I've heard everything from several decades to ten thousand years. Oh wow! Like I've heard everything in between, um, and so it's anyone's guess how much time he experienced in that loop. Now, in early drafts of the story, they wanted to try and explain the loop, and they they. The draft said that he had encountered some woman that he that he made fun of or he hurt in some way, and she, like, cast a curse on him to live this day. And then they decided, you know what, I don't think we need an explanation. Let's just start on day one yeah. and go from there. And I think that's the a magical a, snowstorm. Yeah, it's, it's it's a fantasy sort of a thing. Um, and so, yeah, I, I saw this in the theater when it came out. I fell in love with it. Uh, I watch it on Groundhog Day. Um, I feel like I've lived it over and over and over, which is <laughs> yeah. appropriate. You know, the part that always gets me is the homeless old man. That yeah. part always gets me. When, when he to tries that, to yeah. save his life and the nurse and he, says, and sometimes to, people just die. He tries to give him, like, food. Tries to, every, he tries to try to make that those last few hours, like, that someone cared. Yeah. And, it's still, and he still passes away. And I went, all right. Yeah, and that that was That's like a, a big turning Christmas point. Yeah. kind of a feeling. Yeah, like that, that yeah. was a turning point for that character when he accepted the fact that he can't save everybody and and stuff like that. And so there's a lot of things to get out of this film. And um, it was unexpected. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, it it uh, was a wedge between Harold Ramis and and uh, Bill Murray. Bill Murray wanted it to be more f philosophical. Where Harold Ramis wanted more humor, and they sort of butted heads over that. And despite the fact that Harold Ramis was right, and it really worked as a romantic comedy, uh, Bill Murray and Harold Ramis didn't speak again until H Harold Ramis was on his deathbed. Whoa. And Bill Murray visited him on his deathbed and made amends, and then he died a short time after It's kind of sad. Uh, <laughs> it is. Yeah. I know that this was the movie that, I two, mean, because think the, about their team-ups. Two of the funniest dudes that yeah. came out of the late 70s. Yeah, and we're, we're talking Ghostbusters and yeah. uh, Stripes, and they've just collaborated on all sorts of things. And, and unfortunately, that collaboration ended with Groundhog Day, which is 
so sad considering, to, in my opinion, it's one of the greatest movies ever made. So it's shame that the uh, friendship yeah. ended on that. So any other comments on Groundhog Day? I'll need to add that to my list of movies to watch. Oh, <laughs> you talk no. about taking a shot, George. We'd be all dead if we had a shot. <laughs> <laughs> I want to interject something that I, I think is interesting. Am I too hot here? Sorry. No, no, you're good. Um, I think the original time travel movie might be char- something from Charles Dickens, because right, because you've got a Christmas Carol, and you've got technically like, the ghost that of can Pris- be considered a time well, travel movie. Well, I mean, he movie. does yeah. go forward to the future and, and sees one possible time. future, yeah. and he does go to the back. He's not a part of it. He's like a floating spirit. Yeah, that I think directly leads into my all-time favorite time travel movie, which is. Um, the Jimmy Stewart. Um, it's a wonderful, wonderful life. It's a wonderful life. Yeah. To me, oh, yeah. that is the ultimate. To yeah. find out what what the world would have been like without you. Now but he also goes a, back in time. That and brings up an time. interesting point. Is it a time travel movie or is it a alternate universe story? Well, you may have me there. Yeah. Because he, because I, I thought about putting it on my list, but I didn't because of the fact that he's witnessing a uh, time period that he has lived. But now he doesn't exist in, and so he's seeing what would have been an alternate dimension had he not, you know, had he Based never an been alternate born. Past, present, and future. Yeah, yeah. So that's an interesting conversation. Like, what constitutes a time travel movie? And there's a couple on my list, and a couple that I've seen on other lists where I'm like, really, I, is that a time travel? Because I thought about that. Because Wonderful Life, I was considering that, but then. That because it's an alternate dimension. That's why everything, everywhere, all at once. I didn't put that as a time travel. Yeah, movie because it's just it's alternate. It's, universe. it's, it's yeah. the multiverse, the which multiverse. we've seen a million times over the past yeah. few years. Thank and, you, yeah. Marvel. <laughs> <laughs> now another movie that someone brought up as a time travel movie, and I love this movie, but I don't think it's a time travel movie. Is a movie called Run Lola Run. Have you ever seen Run yes. Lola Run? Yeah, a German movie. Yeah. Yeah. So here's the deal. Uh, and I don't remember all the details. It's been a while. But basically, I remember when I finally watched it for the first time. Here's this woman, you know, going through some adventures in, in this movie. And, you know, the running time on the film says, let's say it's 90 minutes long. 80 thing. I was really was, short. Yeah. yeah. Well, about 20 or 30 minutes into the film, the credits start rolling. And I'm like, did I misread something? Why is this movie ending? Then it starts over again. And little things. There are little differences that change the outcome of the second version of this film. And I'm like, what is happening here? Then that movie ends. A third one starts and shows even more consequences if if someone wasn't there in the right place at the right time. And I'm like, this is one of the greatest movies I've ever seen. I've never seen anything like I it. I thought I'd seen it, but I don't think yeah. I have. But oh. that's the, that begs the question. Is it a time travel movie if it's showing you an alternate version of the it present? It Groundhog's Day in? kind of thing. Is it basically like we said, okay, now if you did this, now if you did this, you're seeing alternate. So the question is, is it a linear time story? Because is she going back and trying to – because she's trying to Well, she's boy. never aware of the changes. That's Only the we, the viewers, yeah. are experiencing those changes. The characters in the film have no idea – Initially, it felt like three different movies to me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was watching like, so I just saw three short films all at once. So I love <laughs> the, the movie, but I, it is – in my opinion, it's not a time travel movie. But I saw it on several yeah. lists. So. Yeah, they'll put that. They put that on there because some of them are saying, "Well, she is going back in time to try to save her boyfriend." I'm like, "Yeah, but it she felt like three separate movies." It is, yeah, and she's not aware of yeah. the consequences from the first film as we get into the second film. So, you guys watch it. You guys, let me know what you think. Now, we mentioned just a little while ago uh, the Terminator movies. Let's talk about the Terminator movies. So. The first one came out in 1984, the year I graduated high school, written and directed by James Cameron, and it was a monster hit. It was just spectacular. Uh, Gave us Arnold Schwarzenegger. Why a cyborg from the future would have an Austrian accent, I don't know. I think they explained it in one of the sequels. Um, But it was just just a great, gritty, noir film that just blows your mind about time travel. Um, but then it took what seven years to get the sequel, uh, also written and directed by James Cameron. That is one of the few sequels that yes. I think superseded the original. Yes. 
it broke ground with effects and and storyline like and performances so cool. and yeah. it's it's one of the most groundbreaking movies of all time uh now in the timeline and i i looked up the timeline of a lot of these movies uh, on my list so uh the human race uh invents skynet uh it becomes self-aware and initiates judgment day in the distant future of 1997. <laughs> um, then uh, the T-800 and... Um, uh, T-1000? Uh, well, the, the T-800 was Arnold Schwarzenegger. Arnold Schwarzenegger. Michael Bean's character, what's his name? Michael uh, Kyle. Uh, Kyle, Kyle Reese. Yeah. They leave 2029, so the, uh, this Judgment Day Only thing... Only five uh, years from now. Couple, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, they go coming. back to 1984 <laughs> initially. So, yeah, yeah, so Judgment Day's... Uh, well, Judgment Day already happened. Yeah. Now we we see the escalation of it in 2029. Um, so that's the timeline. And, and uh, you know, again, it just makes you think about, you know, and this is the thing about time travel movies. If you think too much about them, it starts to make your brain hurt. So, and we're going to have some spoilers here, Andrew, if you haven't seen Terminator oh, yet. Oh, I've um, seen it. Kyle Reese <laughs> travels back in time to save Sarah Connor ends up fathering her child, who's the resistance leader, who then sends Kyle Reese and back that's, to save And there's mother. the headache involved. Yee. But Terminator time travel, wait a minute. <laughs> so did this already happen, or what's going on? Is this? Yeah. Well, and that's part one. In yeah. part two, it gets even weirder with the son, with her son, because he's not old enough. Like, there's, yeah, he's, he's not old enough to be... Who he is based yeah. on 1984 versus 19 seven years later. It was she yeah, could not 91, have had I guess. Yeah. yeah, so he would have been about five years too old for the role, or maybe six or seven. Depend. I don't remember how yeah. old he was. It's just it's there's some weird things that they take liberties with. Yeah, that and that's the weird. So so the Terminator fails in 1984, but they launch their second attempt from the same time period in the future. But this time they're like they send T1000, the liquid metal guy played by Robert Patrick. To 1991. Well, wh why not send him back to 1984? Like, right. <laughs> why, why go? Okay, well, well let's go to 90. So those are questions. And again, also, don't I, think too much. Maybe about you guys it. can answer this. Uh, in the mo in, T in uh, Terminator Two, the the psychologist who's questioning Sarah Connor points out a points out the police station attack, and he actually gives. He said this was seven years ago. Yeah. So mm -hmm. kind of like what you were saying, George. Like, so shouldn't. Kyle, uh, shouldn't uh, uh, John Connor be a seventy-year-old kid? You know what? Because he, he, you're he says, right. and this was uh, this was taken today in, at the mall in uh, L.A. This was taken at the police station seventy, and he gives an exact time. I, I thought it was seven years ago, and I went, wait a minute. No, you're right. The movie couldn't have been set in 1991 if 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 uh, he's a teenager. Are we sure? It, I'll have it, to it look is that set up. In 91, or is it set in 97? That's a, I that's don't a remember. good question. I'll have to look that up. Now I got to go back and see if they have because Dyson because they'll have he'll, they'll have newspapers and now I'm gonna sit there and freeze frame and say what what's the actual date on this thing? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think what's interesting about Terminator though is also that you see very little of the time travel element. It but everything in the present is affected by the fact that they time travel. A lot of a lot of movies are like we're gonna go back and we're gonna recreate the fifties. We're gonna recreate the dawn of the whatever civilization. This one is now, but the MacGuffin behind this one is something that happens in the future, and that's where you remove your brain for the most part yeah. and put it under your seat, and you just enjoy. And it's the effects of the future that affect the present, and and that to me was really interesting. And yeah. on top of that, I'd never seen a movie that once it got going in second, third, fourth, fifth gear, toward the end of the movie, there's a good half hour. It doesn't let up. Yeah, yeah. And you think to yourself. Is that what the future's like? It's like you get into third gear and you think, my God, we can't go any faster. And then you get into fourth yeah. gear and then you think, oh, we can't go any faster. Then fifth gear and sixth gear. And at the end, they keep blowing him up. They keep blowing things up. Things keep happening. Well, that's And he keeps coming back and you think, is this what it's like to live in the future? And by golly, it is. Well, <laughs> that's... Keep asking, is there, is there a downshift? Is there a downshift? We're just going to no... keep going up? You know, this that's one crazy. of the frustrating thing about sequels. And this happened with Terminator. This happened with Alien, the Alien uh, Trilogy is you sit through Terminator 1, you're biting your nails, you think, this guy's unstoppable. They finally find a way to defeat him, and you're like, yay, we win. Sequel comes out, forget everything yeah. in the first movie. There's a new threat, 
The T-800 is now the protector. The T-1000 is now the assailant. Oh, my God, this guy's liquid metal. How, how are we going to defeat him? They defeat him. We go, hey, yay. Terminator 3 comes out. Now there's the Terminatrix, the female Terminator. <laughs> yeah. And so there's no consequences. Like, every time you think you've won, now the next chapter comes out. And it's a little frustrating. You know, this we talked about this with the Alien movies, you know. So... Like in, in Alien 2, Aliens, you're rooting for these characters. Most of them get killed off, but um, uh, the the guy and the girl and Ripley all survive. And then Alien 3 comes out. Well, now two of them died. What? We just sat through two hours cheering them on, and then the third one starts off with them already dead. I have no idea what you're talking I, about. I, <laughs> did you see Alien 3? Did you see uh, Alien? There's no such thing as Alien 3. <laughs> <laughs> never happened. I don't know what you guys I don't the really only, acknowledge the only it. Bad what did you say? There's no such thing as Aliens 3? Yeah, no, it never there's, there's, happened. Oh, yeah. I never saw Aliens 3 either. There's no, there's that, no, that's yeah, the only yeah, Alien I haven't yeah. seen. Yeah. I've seen the rest. Now, the first two, in my opinion, are as a, as a group a Perfect. Yeah. Anyway, we're off on a tangent. Yeah, those yeah. Are really great. Yeah. But my yeah. point is, it's frustrating to invest in these characters, and then the sequel comes yeah. out, yeah. which kind of wipes the the dry erase board clean, and you're going through it all over. Michael again. Bay Transformers but, movies. So <laughs> nothing matters in the previous movie. For for the Terminator movies, just like Back to the Future and Star Wars, I saw the second one first. So when I saw the first one, I I was like, why is Arnold the bad guy? Yeah. Because I mean, it's a complete 180. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. Like, Did you see Jaws two first? <laughs> I've only seen the first one. Well, <laughs> fortunately, well, I want to say something about about Terminator, and that is, is that I didn't see it in the movie theater. So, what's really great about having it on VHS back then is that you popped it in, you watched it, and then you get about halfway through, and you say, "Wait, I'm confused," and then you rewind a part. So. Yeah. I'm doing my own time travel with the <laughs> yeah. VHS jumping itself. Jumping back and forth. Jumping the time back line. and forth the time because I thought I'd missed things. And, yeah. and I don't know about you guys, but I watch everything with subtitles. Every I think you hmm. lose about 30% of the content. At least yeah. I do. If no, you're not do watching it with subtitles. Unless it's a foreign film. But. Oh, I watch them, everything. Huh. And, yeah. and I, my kids will watch it and they'll say, put on the subtitles, put on the subtitles. Because you get to see people's names and that emblazons it in your head. You get to see spellings of things. Sometimes somebody says something under their breath. You get to hear that. Sometimes, like, uh, like they'll say, and Kennedy Day was shot. And like, oh, if people like reacting. Like, why are they reacting? Well, if you didn't have it on, you didn't yeah, see yeah. that. It, it's yeah. just more interesting. But I used to love going back and, and, and watching things um, a second time with the subtitles on that I hadn't seen the first time. Yeah. And that's another time travel story. <laughs> I, have a, I have a friend who you should never, ever uh, get high with because he will ruin your eye. <laughs> because he's like, what's the big deal about time travel, man? Look up into the night sky. You're looking into the past. All that starlight <laughs> happened billions of years ago. So what's the big deal? And, well, thanks, Killjoy. Yeah. No more for you. <laughs> That's a whole other podcast we can do. Yeah. Now, one thing I wanted to point out about, uh, about Terminator, and I, I saw that in an article today that made me think about it, is occasionally, and we're going to talk about this again with some of these other titles, Occasionally something happens in the time travel movie that causes something in the future to happen that might not have happened. So the example in Terminator is at the end of Terminator 1, uh, I think it was Terminator 1, is he go he loses like an arm or something and like a chip or whatever. And in Terminator 2, the, the company behind, is it Skynet or? Dyson. Uh, Dyson. They find the arm. They find the chip. They go, this, this, this is technology that humans don't fully understand yet. It hasn't been created yet. And they, they retrocon the technology that they find to build Skynet or whatever. And so the question is, they send this thing back in time. Did it cause Skynet yeah. to happen or did it happen earlier because of the events in Terminator? Would it ever happen at all had they not sent it back? Again, those are questions that so make the your thing, the brain So the way that hurt. it was explained to me as a kid, because I had a, a I have an ex brother in law now who was pretty cool about stuff like this. He said, "No, no, no. What happened is there were multiple times that that the Terminator went back. We're just seeing it once." Yeah. He said, "He said so because of the inconsistencies, you're you're led to believe." And I didn't find this out on my own. He had to tell me this. So I didn't think it was intuitive, but. Um, that there were multiple iterations and you're just seeing one iteration that, yeah. that maybe in the future, the chip was a, a basic, a more basic chip. And then that went back in time. And then that affected that. 
They never said that, but I kind of went yeah. with that. I thought that was pretty genius. Yeah. I mean, I hadn't thought of that. There were things that, you know, when you get past Terminator 2 that you, you kind of think it kind of ruins the first two movies. He's like, <laughs> my, my central core is a nuclear bomb. I'm like, you mean the one that got flattened in the machine that could have gone off in Terminator 1? Yeah. Are we talking about that one, Arnold? Yeah. The one that could have gone boom? Uh, <laughs> Don't think too hard. Or, I like the analogy that you had about just take your brain out of your head, yeah. put it under your seat, eat yeah. some popcorn, and shut up. Again, yeah. another reason why I love Back to the Future. Nice, <laughs> simple. No, Marty, because we can't. Because we go back here, I'm like, see, Marty, you stupid teen. <laughs> listen to Doc. Or, what That's about right. Terminator Genesis, where John Connor is the bad guy? I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't see that <laughs> one. Oh. I, yeah, do uh, not. Oh. No. I refuse to believe it exists. Waste of time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Now, um, uh, ostrich syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> one franchise that's no stranger to time travel is the uh, Star Trek franchise. Uh, the original series did time travel episodes. The Next Generation did some amazing time travel episodes. There were episodes of The Next Generation that are better than a lot of movies that I've seen in, in the theater, and they told that story in an hour or whatever. Um, and so one of the best entries in the Star Trek franchise was Star Trek Four. Uh, the Voyage Home came out in 1986. Um, you know, they, they kind of dropped the ball a little bit with the first Star Trek. It, yeah. it, it, they tried to be more cerebral. Then they, it, you know, introduced the action uh, between uh, Khan and and Kirk and all that. And, and so when The Voyage Home rolled around, to me, it was one of the best entries in the entire franchise. The original cast coming back. Uh, this one was directed by Leonard Nimoy. Yep. Uh, and they, Nimoy wrote it and Roddenberry gets a screen credit. And I don't know if that's because the movie was based on the series, but he gets a, a writing credit probably just for creating the characters. Um, but in this one, the, the crew of the enterprise travels from 2286, which is the Star Trek present, um, to 1986, um, with this convoluted plot about trying to save whales or something. They're on the verge of extinction. And apparently they were st- alien race seeded earth with these whale creatures or something. Um, but it had humor, it had drama, um, laugh out loud, you know, a double dumbass to you too, you know, that sort of thing. And, uh, just a really great entry in, uh, uh, the Star Trek franchise. What are your memories of Star Trek four? For me, it was probably William Shatner's greatest performance as Captain Kirk. I loved it. Just, you talk about the humor, the thing when, uh, Spock swims with the whales, and you see William Shatner kind of looking around, like where the hell, where the hell is Spock? And then she goes, maybe she's swimming with that man, <laughs> singing to that man. And this, the look of abject horror on his face. No, I I loved it. it. To me, it's a that's a trilogy. It's a trilogy within the franchise. Two, three, and four are all connected. Mm. Because two, because Khan, and then you get Spock dying. Spoilers, <laughs> Andrew. Uh, one day I'll get around. <laughs> and then three, and then the search for Spock, and then the voyage home. So for the yeah. voyage home, you know, yeah, the alien races were there looking for. You know, I, I don't like what Spock said. It'd be presumptuous to us to think that they're talking only to humans. Yeah. And that we could do to whales with as we please. I, I combined two different quotes. But the whole <laughs> point was, you know, it's uh, I you know, I enjoyed that movie. Uh, it, it was great. Yeah, I didn't want to take it too seriously as saying, you know, hey, you know, you just took a lady from the past going back there. Now you start thinking about COVID. Like, what if she brings something to the past in the future? <laughs> well, you're completely screwing us over. But then yeah. you got Star Trek technology here. It's like, what it is. I love the, I love the, when they poke fun of, 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 of the hospital. My God, what is this? The Dark Ages? <laughs> He's like, here, take two of these and come. I grew a new kidney, and I went, oh my God! Isn't that the one where uh, where uh, Scotty like grabs the computer mouse, <laughs> yeah. computer, and they're like, uh, that's no, where they get away with things. That like, is awesome. You know, by doing this, we're changing the past. Well, how do you know he didn't invent the bloody thing? I'm like, ah, oh, come on, Scotty. We cannot. We, I can't use that reason for anything. Like, how do you know he's not the father? You know, that's that's one thing. This applies to the next movie on my list, too, which is First Contact we'll get into. But in both Voyage Home and First Contact, the prime directive goes right out of the window. And that's something that, you know, they've mentioned on the series many times. We can't violate the prime (laughs) directive, which is to alter the, the, the timeline of history. And then in these two movies... They do it willy nilly, like they don't even care. It's like they take the prime directive and treat it like a skeet ship. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we we so, we follow the prime directive when it's convenient. Yeah, so I think that's one of my major number top three pet peeves <laughs> is time travel to get out of a jam because you don't have anything better written. 
or or just to bring it to the to the present and and it's kind of like you know like you've got friends and you say oh you're from russia how is it in russia well russia is real different well how's it real different and then once you run out of that conversation and saying your guys are different from us where do you go from there and i think that that a lot of that is just like oh in the future we don't have this and you guys have that and it's all that and it's like okay this is it's 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 sweet and it's funny but the reality of it is, is a lot of times tra- time travel screws, in my opinion, opinion, screws things up, and I don't oh, yeah. like it. It's a, it's a, it's a weird way out. It's an easy way out. It's a non, it's it's a creative way, I guess. But it's a, it's a non. It it seems to be like the the the, the like we can get out of jail for just at the moment that you think everything's dead, everybody's gone. That, that things are completely lost and, and there's no hope. Let's just go back in time. Yeah. Oh, and then they save everything. And I'm like, well, talk about, I hate that. To your, to your point about kind of painting yourself into a corner and, and yeah. using this as an out, that sort of happened with the Star Trek reboot. So here, you know, they reboot Star Trek uh, with new actors, uh, kind of. Talking about like you Zachary know, Quinto and Chris Pine. Or yeah, yeah, that, that era. Okay, yeah. And then you're thinking, well, if this takes place at the start of the original series sequence right. they're they're forced to sort of follow the same events but then once they've painted themselves into the corner they do this little time thing and they yeah. verbally almost stare into the camera and go now we can go any direction we want because we've sort of reset the timeline. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, so that's how you get out of this uh, dilemma that you put yourself in and yeah. you set yourself up for a whole new sequence of adventures. So. Well, and, and then you, and then as, as, as somebody sitting in the, in the audience, you start to say, all right, well, look, if you, can, if you can go back in time so quickly and so easily, <laughs> why don't you just go back? A minute, it's the Back to the Future thing. Why don't you just yeah. go back a few minutes before and make sure the, was it the Palestinian, not the Palestinian, who was it? The, the Libyans. The Libyans. The Libyans, the Libyans. Yeah, yeah, they don't yeah, have yeah. bombs or something like that. Yeah. It's ridiculous. I mean, yeah. it's, and I, I, I hate that looping And it was, it was <laughs> a teenager's thing. I was like, okay, Marty, you get a few minutes. What are you going to do with a bunch of Libyans with machine guns and a bazooka? <laughs> you going to yeah, stop by the store at night and go like, hey, I need a... Bulletproof vest and a couple other things. Like, oh, what was your plan here, Marty? Thank yeah. God the DeLorean broke down. It was trying yeah, to exactly. save you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If he would have gotten there on time, he'd be dead too. Um, now, just last night, I rewatched First Contact, which came out in 1996. And it's like a really great episode of The Next Generation. And Patrick Stewart's amazing. Uh, Brent Spiner, who plays Data, was given some really cool development moments for his character to learn what it is to be human and that sort of stuff. Um, and in that particular moment, and this is, this is an interesting thing about first, uh, about time travel movies is this is one of only a couple of that I can think of where the crew travels from the future into the past, which is not our past. It's still our future. So they're, they're going from, and oh. I, I wrote all this down. The the timeline for the next generation is the twenty three seventies. This particular movie says twenty three seventy three. They travel back to twenty sixty three, which is you know forty years in our future. So that's kind of interesting. That what is going back in time to them is going still the to our us, future, yeah. which is kind of a cop out. Um, but again, with the prime directive, they have no qualms about the James Cromwell character saying, yeah, you know what, they're going to build a statue right where you're standing, and they're going to name schools after you. And he's like, I don't want to know all this. <laughs> I was like, why, why would and we be telling It's you? like, don't you know about the prime directive? And like, Jordy's an engineer. It'd be one thing if like the art teacher was telling you, like, yeah. like, telling stuff like that. And it's then like, they're like working on the ship right alongside of them to make sure that it launches to get the attention of the Vulcans at the end. And it's like, you're totally screwing up this timeline. Does it make the movie any less entertaining? No, it's an awesome movie. It's really, really great. Um, there's a moment between uh, Captain Picard and Worf where Worf is like, you know, we need to abandon ship and blow it up. And Picard's like, you're a coward. And Worf says, if you were any other man, I would kill you where you stand. I'm like, oh, jeez. And then they have to kind of reconcile later. Um, it's a great movie with lots of great moments. And... Uh, but yeah, they take some liberties with time travel and just 
have no qualms about changing the future. Thank God that wasn't a comedy because I'd be in the background. It plays like a comedy. I'd be mean, like, Jean-Luc, uh, you need Kirk to help you fight an old man in the last movie. <laughs> Worf will kill you. Don't do it. Don't yeah. do it. Yeah, Picard was great in this. Like he, or, or, or Patrick Stewart. Patrick, like, you and full Hearing Captain the Ahab. Borg voices. And yeah, yeah, they make references to Captain Ahab chasing his white whale and, and all that. Oh, yeah. So that's it was, right. uh, that's really cool. That was such a great performance. It was really awesome. Uh, so yeah, there's any number of Star Trek references. There are, no, nothing on these two Star Trek movies. I've only seen the J.J. Uh, Abrams. Wow. The, oh, I think you mentioned. Yeah, and uh, the, the third one with uh, directed by James Wan. <laughs> yeah, that's all I've seen. All right, fair enough. Um, <laughs> another. Now you, you might not. When you think time travel movies, a lot of people might not think of this right away. But then when you start discussing it, you're like, holy cow! Yeah, one of my favorite. Uh, Variations on the time travel theme is The Prisoner of Azkaban, 2004, part of the Harry Potter oh, series. Yes. Emma Watson is given time a little Turner. time turner necklace yeah. so she can uh, attend multiple classes and get her homework done and all that stuff. And it has like this innocent origin. And the fascinating thing about the movie is that for about the first half of the movie, you're following these characters on their adventures, but there's weird little unexplainable things that happen throughout the film that really don't make any sense and you don't really think much about it until you get to the introduction of the time travel device. And then the second half of the movie explains all the little weird things we saw in the first half. And I remember sitting there watching this movie going, that is brilliant. That is apps. One of the best takes on time travel I ever saw. And, and what this movie does for time travel, where back to the future does the branching off of timelines is prisoner of Azkaban basically says that everything you've experienced, if time travel were possible, time travel caused these things to happen. So there's no parallel universe. The, the past caused the present events to happen. And that's how I look at time travel. I wrote a short story about time travel that kind of explores the same theme that anything we're experiencing today, if time travel were possible, was caused by time travel. So like if you were to say, well, why didn't someone go back in time to, to save President Kennedy? You think, well, if he's dead, maybe someone went back in time to kill President Kennedy for whatever reason. Um, that you, was addressed. You know this is the original timeline. <laughs> right. What we're doing right now. Yeah, yeah. So I thought Prisoner of Azkaban was a brilliant, brilliant take on uh, time travel. As a standalone and, movie, I, I loved it. But when as a series, it aggravated the hell out of me because I was like, let me get this straight. You gave that teenager a time travel device? <laughs> exactly. I have seniors in high school who like, my internship is to go hunt a Dementor. I think that kid could use it before he <laughs> gets his brain sucked out of his, you know, go give him a time. And also, can I stop the bad guy by going backwards in time? Any headmasters want to do that? That series yeah. aggravated me. Now, they never it, did readdress the time travel thing throughout the rest so of the series. so many weapons in there that I'm like, I think yeah. the bad guy might want those. To, I think that would yeah. be the number one thing, yeah, that you could turning. destroy everybody and everything and make everyone oh, your yeah. slave with that little teensy tiny there that's yeah. around her neck. It's like, wait a minute. Is there, are there some parameters here? Or is it just, can you just go back in time to whenever? I, I did have a tra- problem with that. Yeah. But you got to take your brain out. Yeah. <laughs> As a standalone movie, I loved it because that it that's when it showed. We graduated from, I love Christopher Columbus. But when it graduated the third year, I went, okay, this is getting a little bit more. Yeah. I like what they're doing here. But the interesting thing about the time travel device is it didn't change anything, at least not from our perspective. It only revealed what Good caused point. the things that happened throughout the film, which is, which makes me... Also, I do uh, think he could have used the time to go back <laughs> five more minutes and say, maybe don't look at the moon. It's <laughs> like, got to help out. Just don't let him, you know, don't let the guy There lose. you go thinking again. <laughs> Just a little bit. I'm like, it's in the movie. I'm like, Hermione, you have right there. Andrew? Harry Potter movies, Prisoner of Azkaban. Uh, was that the third one? Come on, third man. one directed yeah. by yeah. Alfonso Cuarón. <laughs> yeah, so you know who directed it. So, so I've read about it. No, no, that... it's fine. If you read the books, I give no, full credit. No, no, I've never read the books. Oh, He's then, read about well, the read movie, and that it was the best one because they had such a good director. But I, I, my ex made me watch the first two. And I'm like, eh, this this wow. is, this isn't this isn't me. I think the first three movies 
ranks among the greatest trilogies of all time. Yeah, really? Now, I saw every, I never read the books. I saw all the movies in the theater, every single one of them. And I didn't like how they progressively got darker and darker and darker to where characters you liked died. Uh-huh. I, I didn't care for that aspect of it. But I think the first three movies is one of the greatest trilogies of all time. Me personally, I think she lost thread of the story. After after around the fourth book, I was like, oh, what, what what's going on here? What's, yeah. what's happening? Yeah. Okay, is this is what we're going to do. Hope you can, I hope this all comes together. Wait till the eighth, the seventh book. It didn't come together. <laughs> I waited for you. I gave you four books. Yeah. And you did not tie these threads up. Now, but, kids loved them, and, and it introduced a whole generation yeah. of reading, and I, I, I'm like, yeah. I applaud that. On but, that level, yeah. it's... Really, I don't need to rewatch any of the movies after the third one. I, I'll go back and watch the first three. By the way, George, that drinking game would would fell Irishmen and Australians, the two people with the, probably the strongest livers, <laughs> would not survive. <laughs> there you go. Andrew, Andrew would be there in. <laughs> All right, now let's talk about the movie that inspired this podcast. For some strange reason, oh, I, love I, uh, I got obsessed with the movie Somewhere in Time. I, I don't know what triggered it, um, but I, I found it used on DVD. I watched it. I'm like, this is one of the, the greatest romantic movies I've ever seen. Yeah. Um, you then just I love Jane I, Seymour. Uh, oh, well, that's the thing. I smoking. Yeah. I, the DVD I saw was standard F. So then I got Blu ray, and Blu ray, I was like, oh my God. And you have to imagine that the director of Somewhere in Time, and I don't have his name here in front of me, he had to have been madly in love with Jane Seymour because the way she was framed uh-huh. in every shot and that portrait that hung on the wall, you, you can't help but not fall in love with her like or you can't help but fall in love with her that she was just stunning radiant in this movie and oh my god i've never seen a camera caress a lead actress like this movie did now one of the issues that i have about this movie and one of the reasons that i hadn't seen it in decades is the method of traveling back in time. Just about every time travel movie uses technology, some form of technology. Uh, in the case of Azkaban, it's the necklace, but there's a time machine. There's something to get someone back in time. They deliberately said when writing this adaptation of a book, we don't want a time machine. We don't want technology. So it's like, well, how do we get him back to 1912 from 1980? He's going to will himself back in time. And I had a very hard time with that That's back in 1980. That's a hell of a pitch meeting. Yeah. <laughs> so, so how are you going to do it? He's going to think it and make it happen. Yeah. Okay, I- I'm going to interject. Go ahead. That's one of the things I loved about it. I get sick of seeing flux capacitors where they don't explain <sighs> yeah. it. I get sick of seeing, well, we just we, we, we discovered this alien technology. Yeah, right. I love the idea <laughs> that this guy somehow deep in... He goes to this guy who wrote a book, and he goes, "Yeah, for, he goes, I was in this old hotel, and for just a moment, it looked like it was the 1600s." Somehow, she had approached him. He wanted to go back in time. He'd yeah. done his research, and it was love, gentlemen. It was love, and it was also the fact that he might have been a, a little bit excited about such a beautiful woman. But, <laughs> um, but I really actually liked that aspect of it. Me personally, I thought to myself. That's something that an average person could do. And maybe if you want it badly enough and you surround yourself and you put yourself in an old hotel and all these yeah. other things, I love that part of it. In fact, that's the that's my favorite part about the movie. Now, here's the interesting thing. If you really wanted to break it down and really get into the weeds on this, <laughs> you could say we're all made of energy. If you break us down into atoms and molecules, yeah. we're all in energy. So maybe there's some way of controlling passing through time you have some control over that and and if someone came up with a convincing explanation i could all right i'll allow it um (laughs) but here's something that they did not include in the movie that was in the novel that it was based on is toward the end of the movie it was discovered that christopher uh, reeve character uh had a brain tumor and either the brain tumor allowed him this ability to do it or more tragically did it all just exist in his head That's as a hallucination? What I was thinking. And that makes the movie a tragedy if it all exists in his mind. Yeah. yeah but, it, it does kind of seem like a dream yeah. when you watch the whole thing. Yeah. yeah. And here's the question. Now, let's say he did physically go back in time. Here's my question. Does his body still exist in the present? 
And for every day that he's in the past, is he laying in this bed, starving himself to death while he's having fun in the past? Because toward the end of the movie, spoiler alert, the doctor's like, who looks like he hasn't eaten in days. Now, part of it was the grief process of being pulled back to the present and, and, and experiencing the grief of loss. But you could argue that he's been laying in bed for days, starving himself slowly. So he wasn't going to be able to experience this for any length of time. If that's, that's a the really case. interesting thing. I hadn't thought of that. that yeah. He, I just naturally assumed that he came back exactly on the day that he left, that he just, his consciousness was on pause for half a second while he went back and partied in 1912. No, here's a clue that that did not happen. When he is pulled back to 1980, oh. he's in a completely different room. He's in the room that was Elise's room when they were sitting on the floor eating chicken. So, so when he came oh, back yeah. to the present, he was in a different room. And he had to leave. Yeah, and, and, and he come would back have found to his original. So, well, okay, I, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, is he, is he roaming the grounds of the Grand Hotel in this stupor as he's back in time? what is happening to his physical body while he's exploring the past? These are questions that make you think. And did he starve himself to death? Or what's he eating in the past? You know, if, I mean, he's eating chicken, chicken with Elise at the end. Is he, is he consuming nutrients that is sustaining his body or is it all, all in his mind? Uh, Could be all in his mind, man. Because if it's all about energy and willing yourself, I would have willed myself to stop eating double stuffed Oreos. <laughs> and I'm telling well, you right now, it did not, I was not your, willing it hard enough. In your version of somewhere in time, you reach into your suit pocket and pull out an Oreo. Yeah. No! <laughs> you get sucked back to me. Well, I think it's interesting because this is the second movie that Christopher Reeves in that was time travel. Can you remember what the first one was? Superman. Well, Superman, he dabbled in time travel. There you travel. go. He goes backwards. I always loved the idea that he went oh. super ticked off and he went counter he, he, he changed the rotation of the earth. <laughs> yes. Which yeah. were only for Richard Donner. With that. <laughs> I'm surprised that Neil deGrasse Tyson didn't have an aneurysm when he saw <laughs> Superman. Because who says that by rotating the earth in the opposite direction, you're going to go back in time? Bugs Bunny. More than likely, <laughs> everyone's going to fly off the planet or something. I don't exactly. know. But yeah, that was, in my opinion, I love the original Superman. But that little time travel element was one of the worst endings in movie, and and somewhere in time probably is the second worst ending because it was so heartbreaking to, to be pulled back into the present and be so overcome with grief that you just allow yourself to wither away, and then they're reunited in the afterlife. You know, this is why I shouldn't read your text half asleep because when you said somewhere, so when you said somewhere in time was doing, I thought you said about time. And that was the H.G. Uh, Wells. Yeah, time machine. Well, yeah. the time machine was the H.G. Uh, H, uh, well, yeah, Wells. Well, yeah, but in, in About Time, H.G. Mm-hmm. Wells and Jack the Ripper. Oh, no, that's 19- that's time after time. Time after time. time, after time. time. They time all have time, time yeah. in the title. But time About yeah, yeah. Time is another one yeah. that I really <laughs> love, and that's a romantic one. That was actually on the top of my yeah. list. I, I saw that in the theater. and That's a really, I love Very underrated. One. Very Ex- underrated. Excellent. Yeah. Now, here's something. I was, I was sharing this with a buddy of mine. He's a big Somewhere in Time fan. And I was watching Titanic recently on the anniversary of the sinking. And as I'm watching Titanic, I'm like, I can't help but think that James Cameron was a fan of Somewhere in Time because there are a lot of similarities between the two movies that um, it's 1912. Both movies are set in 1912. Uh, the one character who doesn't really belong there which is Jack and, and uh, the Christopher Reeve character, fall in love with this female. She falls in love with him in a very short am- uh, amount of time, literally like two days in both movies they fall in love. Um, they're suddenly and violently separated from each other and reunited in the afterlife. And, and they're, those are just too many coincidences to think, that it is just a coincidence. I can't help but think that somehow, somewhere in time, inspired. I Titanic. don't disagree with you, Joe. I'm just saying the cynic in me is that look at the men she had to choose from. <laughs> the first man that actually listened to her because she had Billy Zane yeah. in that world, and so the first guy but, that says, but, ta- "But somewhere in time did the same thing. Like she has yeah. been controlled by this pr- yeah. uh, producer, director, whatever you want to call yeah, him, and he Plummer. treated her like right? garbage. Yep. Now she meets a guy for the first time who." gets her and wants her and and she's like well this is new 
Both of those female characters ex- reacted the same way. Yeah, it's like some of the right. social media stuff see? I see tonight when people are like, he listens to me. I'm like, that's the, that's the bar we're trying to clear. Like, All right, <laughs> fellas, thank you for making this, putting that bar on the floor for me. Well, using, yeah. using that logic, then you could say it's Romeo and Juliet. It's very similar. Yeah, and that's they how Cameron pitched the idea. Yeah. Yeah. Cameron yeah. said, okay, picture this Romeo and Juliet on the Titanic. Yeah. And they were like, sold. Yeah, so, that, yeah. yeah. I mean, the other crazy. elements that have been, the story elements that have been told I mean, for We did centuries. this on, on, our, on our previous show. The the part that gutted me the most was when she dropped the diamond in there. I was like, well, I listened I to your so story. Mad. I listened to your damn story. <laughs> <laughs> you knew that's what I was looking for, and you pitch it into the water. Oh, you selfish. <laughs> I was so mad about that, too. I thought any moment, what's his name? It was a Bill Paxton. Yeah. yeah. Would come up and just help her over the <laughs> yeah. side, yeah. too. Like, you're you going to what? Get it. Yeah. I was so I mean, think about what that diamond could have done for her granddaughter and her family. I mean, they said it would be more valuable than the whole I mean, All those guys risking their lives stupidly it. to find it. You couldn't just say, yeah. here? Yeah. yeah. I mean, just, uh I oh, listened well. to your story. You <laughs> murdered Jack. I've done the math. <laughs> She's the villain in this picture. She so, the yeah. This picture. But you have to agree, there's a lot of coincidence between those two movies. Um, the next movie on my list uh, is sort of in the a variation on the Groundhog Day theme, uh, Edge of Tomorrow, yeah, 2014. That's a really Tom cool Cruise, movie. Emily yep. Blunt. Uh, some alien race arrives in, on Earth via meteor, I guess. Yep. Uh, land in Germany in 2015, conquer much of Europe. Uh, the world comes together, forms a united defense force. In 2020, the futuristic date of 2020, and uh, Tom Cruise's character sort of gets infected by the blood of one of these aliens that he killed and lives the same day over and over, learning each time what he needs to do to defeat these aliens. And it was, a again, a very unique take on the whole time travel concept, being given the opportunity of living the same day over but having the ability of being aware of it and learning from it and um dying and coming back yep. and dying and coming back it was it was a really a, a pleasant surprise like i when i saw it in the theater i i didn't know what i was getting myself into and I'm i like, saw emily wow. blunt as an action star i yeah. went oh my god she, she was cool. she, she yeah. did that push that might have been the first movie i ever saw her but she's in, bouncing yeah. on just her arms she really did that and yeah. i went oh my god yeah, she was yeah. fantastic. Yeah, she was fantastic in that, yeah. yeah. I was like, was John Krasinski, movie. be pay attention. Yeah. <laughs> He's probably like, i got to get into better Jack Reacher shape. <laughs> or like, uh, no, what was uh, Jack Ryan shape? What's no, interesting what? What's interesting about that is that it starts out and it feels typical. And I'm not I'm not in love with the movie until about 30 minutes into it. And then I'm like, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now it's making sense. Wasn't he, he was kind of arrogant and kind of yeah. shunned by the fellow recruits or whatever, and that's typical for Tom Cruise well, he, to be the he outsider. Because he played the propagandist, and then he yeah. messed around with someone's wife or so he pissed <laughs> off some higher up and, like, sent him to the front line. Yeah. Now, wasn't there some controversy with the title? Was it Was it the original title, Edge for Edge of Tomorrow, or did they – they change put it at some, some point. They put something. What wasn't it like? Well, on the DVD live, release, die, repeat, yeah, or something like the that. The DVD release came out in the title. You can barely see, and it says "Live, Die, Repeat" in big letters on the DVD. I, and I, I think never understood I thought that was the yeah. I thought that was the the, the, the title as well. Right. So I went in and, and I was think like, I want to see "Live, deliberate. Die, and Repeat." What's going yeah. on? And the guy's like, "It's called The Edge of Tomorrow." I'm like, yeah. okay, whatever. I think they regretted calling it "Edge of Tomorrow" because what does that mean exactly? But "Live, Die, Repeat" is basically the script better. of the movie. Yeah, that is. When you got a script, yeah, here it is. "Live, Die, Repeat." All right, I'm green lighting. Where I'm it. going? Yeah, yeah. So that was a, a, a pleasant surprise and a, a unique take on uh, the time travel, uh, living the same day over and over That's again. Like getting "Live, Die, Repeat" and say, "What is this about?" It's about post-colonial sugarcane plantations. What? <laughs> <laughs> I was not expecting this. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, I just saw a movie this past weekend, and this was one of the most unique takes on time travel I've ever seen. You could argue against it being a time travel movie, but it, it, it kind of checks all the boxes. And I'm mad at myself that it took me almost 25 years to see this movie for the first time. It came out in 2000. <laughs> it's called Frequency. Have you seen Frequency? It's yes. the one with the radio. Dennis Quaid, and, yeah. uh, ham radio. And, uh, 
Jim and Caviezel. Jim Caviezel. Yeah. Yeah, Jesus. Um, <laughs> I always refer to him. <laughs> He's never going to escape it. He's never going to escape that. What's cool about this is here's a movie that's 25 years old. I sat down to watch it. I knew nothing about it. It was like seeing it in the theater for the first time. I was blown away by the plot twists. And after after seeing the movie, I read some reviews and stuff. And one review said that when when this person saw it in the theater, he said it was one of the few times where the audience got up and cheered at the end of the film and like applauded and cheered. And I'm like, I miss that. I miss that live audience experience of seeing the crowd go wild at the end of the movie. Um, I, in my opinion, I, I put it on my top 10 list. I thought it was one of the greatest time travel movies I've ever seen. And uh, I might have to rethink adding it to my hundred greatest movie list. I thought it was a great film with great twists worthy of M night Shyamalama ding dong. What was the, uh, <laughs> what was the name of the movie with the, uh... Keanu Reeves and Sandra Bullock. That's a lake house. The lake house with the, with the mailbox. The yeah, time travel. and it's similar. It's similar, but in the lake house, which I haven't seen yet either, but I did watch the trailer. They're two years apart living, occupying the same space, the same lake house. And frequency, it's it's the same concept, but it's 30 years yeah. apart. Where the father and the son are able to communicate with each other through the radio. In the lake house, they correspond with handwritten letters in the yeah. mailbox, but... Uh, it's a two year gap, but yeah. yeah. So, uh, similar concepts, but again, you know, I said this at the start of the podcast, any unique, different take on time travel I'm there for. And, and I thought frequency really did a fine job of taking the concept and tweaking it and having yeah. fun with it. I, I love the ending. I'm glad they didn't go the way that I thought they were going to go, which mm-hmm. is more, a little darker ending. Yeah. But, uh, you know, my friend tried to put a uh, galaxy quest on time travel because it, with the one with Tim Allen. And yeah, no, I love Galaxy. Because at the end, they go back. He goes back in time because of the Omega 13 thing. And I he goes back one that. minute. So because there's an oh, element of time travel in there. Yeah. They want to make it a time. I'm like, you can't do that. That's not what the movie's That's about. That's like saying Die Hard is a Christmas movie. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, Nick, there's time travel Elements. in it. So you have to admit it. Is there time? I was like, you. <laughs> I'm not going to do it, but fine. I'll, I'll admit to it. But no, I love, I love Frequency. Yeah. Did you guys? You guys haven't seen it. I've seen it. It's been years. I don't okay. remember it that well. I did. I did enjoy it though. At the yeah, time. yeah. Um, did right. you? I think you had a movie you wanted to talk about oh, too. Oh, I was just going to talk about Looper if, oh, if we ever get it. to it. But yeah, no, we are going to get okay. to it. Okay, I'm going <laughs> to kind of gloss over number ten on my list was Palm Springs, which we touched on. It's like Groundhog Day with a modern uh, take. Now on my list of honorable mentions, because of you, Andrew. Huh? I actually followed through on my promise Yay. to see a movie I hadn't seen. <laughs> yes. So I just recently watched Looper and really thoroughly enjoyed it. Oh, good. Yes. Uh, yeah, good there's there's issues. There's there's time travel issues with the movie, but um, I I really enjoyed it. It did feel like it became a completely different movie when they got to the farm. Yes. It almost kind of went in a different direction. Yeah. Um, but I after it was all said and done, I'm like that was. Pretty darn good. So thank you, Andrew, for yes, recommending it. Uh, go ahead wasn't, and share it. Wasn't that great with Jeff Daniels playing like the, the villain, the, the bad dude? Yes. Yeah, when yeah. did you ever see Jeff Daniels play the bad dude? I don't know. Um, do you remember the scene where his friend comes back and he tries to escape, mm-hmm. and then like his foot disappears and then his fingers disappear? Yeah, that freaked. I saw that in the theater, and that legitimately freaked me out. Yeah, now, I'm glad that you brought that up. because back that's, to the future that's phenomenon. A, well, <laughs> it's not quite back to the future because uh, yeah. it's the linear time travel uh, idea, but like frequency, something that happened in the past can be witnessed happening in the yeah. future. In frequency, the father uses a, a, like a soldering iron to write something on the desk and his son sees it being written out in the desk where if time travel were real, you would think that it had always been in the desk because he wrote it 30 years ago. They did the same thing in looper. Like, okay. So they, they lop off the guy's finger, you know, 30 years ago or whenever, whatever the date was. And he's witnessing his body parts disappear. And I'm like, but he would, never would have had that finger because they cut it off right, when he was right. a young man. So those, again, are the types of things you don't want to overthink. Then, but it was 
one of the eeriest scenes I've ever seen. I know. That was and, crazy. And then with the, with the, the scarring on the, the yeah. arm. Yeah, they were able to send messages yeah. back and forth. But yeah. So instead Written of- and directed by Ryan Johnson, who made the least controversial <laughs> Star Wars movie of all time. No, no. Yeah, that, that's, we're not, not going to engage in propaganda on this show. <laughs> so- Excellent. I thought a fair a fairly original take on on the genre. Yeah. Fairly original. Now, one thing that was a little confusing, and I, I kind of wish they would have went a different way, but when the young Bruce Willis, uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, meets the older Bruce Willis for the first time, they show what happens when the older Bruce Willis gets away. I think that scene should have been him killing Bruce Willis, watching him grow old for 30 years, then deciding he was going to go back in time and cause those events to happen. I would have liked to have seen it laid out that, that way. That would be a great like alternate way to do it. Yeah. That'd be, because I, think, I was confused because after seeing him escape and everything, then all of a sudden there's this edit where he goes, blam, takes the gold and lives his life. And I'm like, well, why didn't they just do that the first time around yeah. and then have him escape later? So what, whatever caused him to make that decision, that's up to them. But I would have done it differently. And I, I, I like the whole story of the little kid being eventually grown up to be this yeah. terrible villain who yeah. is able to liquidate cities <laughs> Because he has that a, a mutation power, yeah. of of the it's, telekinesis. It's, yeah, that, it's it's briefly yeah. talked about how like ten percent of the population in the future can can M- mu- move things with their yeah. minds. And yeah. uh, his friend Seth, he can he has that power. He can, it shows him messing with a quarter or something. Yeah, um, I thought that was cool. Um, and spoiler alert: he ends up shooting himself to to kill the future, the future, yeah. the Bruce Willis character. In order to save the kid, so hope, hopefully the kid doesn't. With no guarantee that the kid's yeah, still going to grow up to be this like, monster. Hell of a risk. Yeah, uh, he, I mean he still gets grazed by a bullet, and yeah. maybe that makes him the rainmaker. Who knows? Yeah. But also Emily Blunt, which we just talked about, great, great, great part for her. Yeah. Also showing that she can be a badass. Yep. I wanted a little bit more of a twist when they were talking about this rainmaker character. I'm like, ooh, who's the rainmaker? And and they show Bruce Willis's character going after these children, and I'm like, maybe he's targeting the wrong thing. And and then I thought, oh, maybe maybe young Bruce Willis and em- Emily Blunt conceive Rainmaker yeah. or whatever. And then it's like, no, it's that kid right yeah. there. And it's like, well, that was kind of anticlimactic. Like it was right there in front of us the whole time. So I was I wanted a little bit more of a twist, but um, but yeah, I mean, it seems almost like this is a movie that's screaming for a sequel because yeah, I want to see if that sacrifice had any impact on what this kid and grew up to become. I, I yeah. thought there would be a sequel, but they've taken too long now because Bruce Willis can't do anything yeah. because of his condition. But, yeah. you know, my friend, when we saw Looper, which was, again, one of the many positives about it, my friend goes, if you could kill your future self, would you? I said, if you turn, if you found out that he was a monster, <laughs> I was like, uh, yeah. Yeah, if I found out that I turned into a complete and utter genocidal <laughs> dickhead in the future... I would, um, yeah, I'd put two in the, I'd put two in the dome, because yeah. and I'd leave a note to myself: don't become a genocidal dickhead <laughs> in the future. As a cautionary tale, like don't become that. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'd be like, don't do that. Otherwise, what's going to happen? My night, my my twenty seven year old version of stuff. I warned you. I warned you. Yeah. Now you got to eat lead. But see, like that's the other thing that makes my head hurt is by killing his younger self. Yeah, that's a that problem. means that older Bruce Willis never existed, yeah. and and all the pain and suffering and everything that he caused never happened but they're out is to say well no he's going to disappear at that moment it's like well did he ever exist beyond the moment that he shot himself that's the kind of stuff that drives me crazy yep. a times a time travel movie that always gives great consequences time cop ridiculous movie but when you pay, take two and put them together they turned like a, a like a mess i'm like oh my god yeah hey, that's something yeah go ahead. I, I would never, if my future self came back now and said, I have to stop you, I'm like, remember, whatever you do to me, I'm going to visit upon you a thousandfold. If I don't, if I, I will become lactose intolerant to mess with you in 20 years. If you keep this up, I'll just drink milk every day, buddy. So you better just tell me what I did wrong and I'll do it. But don't come in and put a gun on me. Now, since you brought up Time Cop, I saw it in the theater when it came out and I thought it was entertaining. John Claude Van Damme was taking advantage of that action era there. Um, But I have a major, major problem with the film, and that is that at the beginning of the film, there's only one known time travel device 
yet the government created an entire police force knowing that they own the one time travel advice or device which then promptly gets stolen by the villain and they're like oh we have a backup so go why would you create an entire police force knowing you own and control the one device that can send you back in time i walked out of the theater just just stewing about that so there were ongoing script problems <laughs> <laughs> but it was an entertaining movie have you guys ever seen, and I think it won all kinds of awards at, at Sundance, a movie called Primer? I did. And I've I, heard of it. I've I, not I, seen it. I hated it. I, That's the one I texted you guys about. Oh, I it was absolutely oh, yeah. loved it. Re I, I okay. absolutely loved it. We're going to go another 30 minutes here. <laughs> uh, having George explain why he loved this movie that I consider one of the worst movies I've ever seen in my entire life. I loved it. I watched it, and then I watched it again immediately, <laughs> right after. It's the only me. movie I watched with my family. They're like, I don't know. They went to bed scratching their heads. I watched it immediately. Then I recommended it to my brother-in-law, who liked the movie Pie and some other things that had come out at the time, which were low budge, and he hated it. But I loved it because uh, it to me it made sense. I had to I had to watch it a second and a third time. I couldn't follow it. Yeah, I had to watch it a second and third time, and I thought, okay, that makes sense. But I love the fact that these guys pulled off something that was to me effective for really really low low budget movie. Mm -hmm. I, I I absolutely and I thought if these guys had had a little bit more revision, a little bit more budget, a little bit more time possibly. They could have really turned it into something. I thought that was really fantastic. And that's some of its major flaws. It's so low budget that it felt very cheap. The actors all felt too young for the roles that they were in. They looked like high school kids playing scientists and business people and stuff. Um, you know, the, the technology just didn't seem to work. And, uh, and it was so dialogue heavy that I couldn't help but think that the filmmakers were Tarantino fans. And, and the premise was, well, what if Tarantino did a time travel movie and Tarantino would spend 30 minutes explaining time travel by <laughs> talking about, you know, Royale with cheese and all this stuff. That's kind of what the movie felt like to me is, is it was too dialogue heavy trying to explain everything on the screen and that's something we talked about at the beginning of the podcast. Don't spend so much time trying to explain it. Just show us how it works, what it does, and what's the impact on society. And I thought it failed miserably. I liked I, it. I liked oh, it quite wow. a bit. I'm glad that you and I are in the same room. This is cool because I like to hear <laughs> wow. other people's opinions on things. And you actually have ruined it a little bit for me. I'm gonna, <laughs> so I got. Yeah. I, I know I'll have to at least check out the trailer and just kind of see see something. Now I'm now I'm curious about this movie. I mean, there's moments where the camera is out of focus, and I'm like, come on, these guys, guys. did this. I mean, this they had. I I think they had really low budget. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> to me, I just looked up seven thousand. Yeah, wow. Really low that was budget. the budget. And yeah. it seven thousand US. <laughs> and it shows. I think. Yeah. There's a there's a scene in there where he's sleeping next to his wife and um he's he gets up in the middle of the knife and he goes and they and they and, and they do like a an interview over the top of it. You know, you can watch it as a as a as a on the D V D. The commentary. Yeah. Commentary, pardon me, yeah. And he goes, That's actually my sister playing my wife. He goes, <sighs> But you can't see it, but there's a a, 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 a thin glass between the two of us. Because they had no money. And he couldn't hire somebody. And they're like, well, the woman that was supposed to play his wife couldn't show up. He's like, yes, yeah. his sister. His sister's like, no way, no way, no way. He's like, please, I got nobody else. And so she did. I I actually like that. I think that's gritty and it's crazy. I would applaud her, it if it was an Anne. looks real. It's, so, <laughs> it's almost like there's something. Where, what is she channeling? I would applaud it if it was an entry in the ONTV Wildwood Film Festival. <laughs> but as a major motion picture, I thought it It failed. wasn't a major motion. Seven thousand. You know what's crazy? What? You're just gonna shock the hell out of you. As I was looking at list of time travel movies, there was a, a journalist for Popular Mechanics who published his top t top twenty five or thirty list of time travel movies. He had that at number two oh. behind Back to the Future, and I got angry. <laughs> and I want I searched for his contact info. I couldn't find it, but I wanted to send him an email and go. <laughs> What the? Are these your buddies? Are you trying to just give a little press to your buddies? I don't know. I would. Film? I would give him a number high five for two. That. Number two. I oh, don't know. That's, that's number that's, two. Yeah, that's number little... two is hard. Number two. Oh, is hard. I, I did want to give a shout out to Bruce Willis for time trial because he, he had twelve monkeys. Yeah, which was on there, and he, I enjoyed because I was I always thought that's where Brad Pitt channeled 
his his character for Fight Club, some of the yeah. the madness oh, when I yeah. see him in there. I was like, yeah. I see some of Tyler Durden in there. I had a hard time getting through Twelve Monkeys, but one observation I did make is Pete Davidson got his entire personality from Brad Pitt's character in Twelve Monkeys. <laughs> Dark circles under his eyes, <laughs> manic <laughs> manic expressions and stuff. I'm like that. Pete Davidson stole that identity. He's an identity <laughs> thief. But no, I, I, I tried getting through 12 Monkeys, and, and it was very hard for me to get through it with Bruce Willis drooling and and just playing a, just this whack. character. I made the mistake of recommending that movie in the height of the pandemic. Yeah. Probably not the best time for me to say that to my friend. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to watch this. Yeah, I had a tough time with it. And I'm, I'm not normally a Terry Gilliam kind of guy. I know there are people who worship him, but oh, Brazil. not, not Brazil. my Brazil. kind of yes. thing. Uh, let's talk about something, and I'm going to turn this over to you, Andrew, uh, Interstellar. Mm. I know oh, yeah. you're a big Christopher Nolan fan. Um, so we were talking earlier today in the office, is Interstellar a time travel movie? And I, I say absolutely, I think it is. I do too. Because the beacon, the, the device, the MacGuffin that draws Matthew McConaughey into the outer reaches of space is himself, spoiler alert, calling himself out. And of yes, it is absolutely a time travel movie. What, what are your thoughts on Interstellar? When, but, oh, I saw opening night. With my buddy Grant, and uh, when 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 it was revealed that the time jumps, I'm like, oh yes, this is so good. The only thing I didn't like about this, I mean, I, I shouldn't say I didn't like, but I, my friend pointed it out, and it, it it seems to be more common with more recent Christopher Nolan movies is there is a lot of explaining, like <laughs> when he's talking to uh, Michael Caine and. You know, he's trying to, they're trying to talk about, to tell the audience, like, oh, okay, this is what's going on. This is what happened. And, <laughs> and adds an extra 15 minutes to the movie, right? And they do that with Tenet a little bit. Yeah. Um, they do. Another crazy movie. It reminds I me of Tenet. Hot Tub Time Machine, where Craig, <laughs> Craig Robinson goes, it's like a hot tub time machine. And he stares directly into the camera, like, guys, get it? <laughs> it's, it's kind of the it's same right. concept. And, 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 and Christopher Nolan does have to learn how to. Sh- to show, not tell, uh, with a lot of things, but yeah, I agree. But the the cinematography of that movie is beautiful, excellent. It, like, and of course, like with all his movies, on a technical level, that movie is yeah, as, I kinda, as great it's as you can get. Heartbreaking. Oh yeah, yeah. on yeah. so many it's levels. Sad. The guy yeah. that's waiting in the ship, the the girl who, I mean, just yeah, yeah. it's so and it 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 to me. Space is one of those lonely, lonely, cold places, right? In space, no one can hear you scream, mm-hmm. right? The old alien thing. Yeah. And them going out into outer space uh, and trying to get things figured out and being gone for a really long time and leaving people behind and all of that, um, I absolutely love that because it seems the infiniteness of space and the, 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 the time that you use to travel and all that it's never given back to you, and that to me mm-hmm. it is in itself a mini time travel. They yeah. mentioned that mo- concept in Contact with uh, Matthew McConaughey and Jodie Foster, where she says, "Say you go on this trip. By the oh, time yeah. you come back, everyone you loved is gone, long, oh, yeah. Yeah. long right. gone." So they what say, is, "So what is it worth?" Yeah, a device that Nolan used in that is, I guess, there's like a click that you hear throughout the the movie, and each click is Morse code. No, 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 no. It's a it's a period of time on Earth, so oh, each right. click. It's like a day or something on Earth, so it's like click. Oh, click, I didn't know that. Click, yeah. So each click represents time passing on Earth, you know. And they say, oh, you know, going back is going to cost us five years or something like that. But there's definitely huge influences from 2001: A Space yeah. Odyssey yeah. and a movie that I love, Disney's uh, The Black, Black Hole, Hole, where all these movies what they have in common is. The first three quarters or most of the movie is kind of rooted in reality, but then that last act is just this abstract, crazy, colorful art. It, it's like they, they kind of get away from linear storytelling and just throw all these colors, and that's kind of at the end of Interstellar. It's like, what is happening here? Yeah. These boxes and cubes, yeah. and you can, he's, he's depending inside, on which one you look at. Yeah, 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 and it's mind-blowing. And, and you know, we've talked about this before. There was a director that said the audience doesn't necessarily have to know exactly what's going on in the film as long as they're entertained. And that's yeah. a perfect description of Interstellar. Yeah. I have no idea what happened in that movie, but it was entertaining. <laughs> it as was. Well. 
Yeah. I think religion takes a little of that too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's awesome. That's fantastic. Uh, I got a couple more movies on my uh, honorable mentions. Uh, Planet of the Apes, 1968. You don't realize it's a oh, time travel yeah. movie until the big reveal. Yep, yep. Um, and the timeline on that is uh, the astronauts leave the Earth in 1972. They crash land on what they think is a foreign planet, an alien world, only to have the big reveal at the end. I, I don't want to spoil it for Andrew because he no, probably no, hasn't no. seen it. <laughs> I've, I've seen bits and pieces where I could say probably I've seen two-thirds of the movie. All right. Now, I don't know how I think that's one of Charlton Heston's <laughs> biggest, most goofy endings. Over the top. Over the yeah, top. Yeah. Damn it all to hell. And all this. I mean, you just... know what's fun? Uh, one time during one of my L.A. trips, I found the beach where they filmed that, and I had my buddy record me as I'm on my knees pounding the surf. No. Going, damn you all to hell. <laughs> and after I was done, there were some people on the beach that were like, Bravo, no, <laughs> bravo. That was a blast. That was a lot <laughs> of fun. Much. Now if you send that video on, it turns into a meme of go pound sand. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't know how they came up with this number, but apparently apparently, the time period that uh, when the, the big reveal happens was they were on Earth in the year 3978 Whoa. Uh, that somehow the ship they were in got sent into that far of the future. So, And I got to say that the remakes – are some of the best CGI I've ever seen in my life. And they, there's a I new like Planet those. of the Apes movie coming out this year. It looks good. Yeah, I've really yeah. enjoyed those. You guys like yeah. those? I can't stand them. The them. remakes? You don't oh, like the really, remakes? I'll have to see them. Okay, I'll have to, I haven't seen the, re, the real one, the, the new ones, but I saw a lot of the old ones. Well, the They're sequels just... to the original Planet of the Ape, the budget got smaller and smaller and smaller to the point where they had like three apes or maybe two and a baby. Um, the budget really shrunk on some of those sequels but the I, first one is a classic i haven't seen any of the latest remakes because they're great. because yeah, of they're tim good. because of tim burton and the mark, mark oh, Wall. oh yeah, no 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 we're not talking it. about that when, one. I saw, then that was when i saw that i went ah oh, and then that when i heard so that, and, and it was so bad that they took a long time before they started this latest series of movies yeah yeah, yeah the that, first one with james franco and yeah. john lithgow it's i really liked it now I, the, i'd have to start there because, <laughs> yeah 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 Which now one, the what tim, was that one called I think it was just called Planet of the Apes, wasn't it? I think so. Now, mm. what that Tim Burton version of Planet of the Apes did to the franchise is what Batman and Robin did to the Batman franchise, oh, yeah. where it 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 was on life support. What's Batman? And someone and Robin? had to <laughs> <laughs> someone had to pull out the paddles and go clear. Um, that almost ended the franchise, but when they relaunched it, uh, it it's brilliant. You're it's about absolutely the Christian brilliant. Bale relaunch. The uh, oh, you mean the first Batman? Batman, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it took from the after Batman and Robin almost killed the franchise. Was, it oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Christian Bale franchise to I revive thought you meant Batman. Batman and Robin revived it. I'm like, no, 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 oh, no. no. Bat, I think Batman God and Robin it. killed it. Yeah, totally. Now the Planet of the Apes movie that you referred yeah. to pretty much killed that franchise until they brought it back years later. And if you I haven't seen it, check it out. It's, it's they're brilliant. With Christian Bale. That was yeah. to me just. Brilliant. You know the weirdest yeah. thing is the most unbelievable part about that Tim Burton Planet of the Apes is Mark Wahlberg as an astronaut. <laughs> <laughs> that one, that, I, that's that ending was the worst too. The Lincoln oh, Memorial geez. ending. That, I, yeah, I, I. That's one of the few Tim Burton movies I've completely blocked out of my mind. Yeah. I, I do, yeah. don't own it and don't, <laughs> I was don't like, plan what? on owning it. Now we are. Uh, this is the longest podcast we've done to date. Yes, it is, and it's coincidentally the time travel uh, <laughs> podcast. I wish I could um, go back. And- <laughs> I want to throw out one more movie, and then if you guys have any any other titles you want to throw out, uh, you can do that. But I want to talk about the grandfather of time travel movies. We touched on it briefly earlier, and that's The Time Machine in 1960, which starred Rod Taylor, Alan Young, who was Wilbur on Mr. Ed, which I can't get over, Yvette Mimieu, who was in The Black Hole, and some other things. Um, this is based on the H.G. Wells story that was published in 1895, which is crazy that somebody in 1895 is thinking that far into the future and thinking about time travel. Um, so the present day for the time machine is New Year's Eve as they go from 1899 to 1900. 1900 yes. Um, and then he tells his colleagues to meet him back at his house in five years or five days. And uh, he goes through all this adventure and then comes back five days later, beat to hell. Um, and the time, the, the novel uh, 
only refers to the time traveler, like the traveler. Uh, the movie calls him H.G. Wells. They name the character after the author. And in that movie, and this is probably the record for the furthest in time that any time traveler has ever traveled, uh, he arrives at 802,701 A.D. So he's, he's going 800,000 years into the future. And the premise of the film is that uh, humans have a tendency to destroy themselves and they wipe out most of the population and the surviving population. Some of them go underground. Some of them stay above ground, which is sort of a parable about the elites and the haves and the have nots. The underground humans evolve into this uh, race called the Morlocks. Morlocks, yeah. Furry creatures with glowing eyes. Which I think is a predecessor to the Slee Stack. Yeah, very yep. similar concept. Yeah, yep. yeah. And the people that stayed above ground are all sort of idiots. <laughs> they have no interest in learning and books and stuff. They just eat and, and just accept their fate, and the, the Morlocks eat them for supper. Or livestock. They, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, that's right. They exist as livestock. Now, the concepts in the novel and the the uh, movie are fascinating and really make you think. Unfortunately, the movie came out in 1960 where effects weren't quite where they needed to be. Um, you see toy cars getting pushed by lava and it's just brutal. <laughs> and there's clear split screens where there's like a studio set and something else happening here and there's a split screen. And so the, the effects kind of ruined it for me, but the concept of this device and again this this is linear time travel you could only in this device you can only go forward and backward in time you you don't create new offshoots um and so it was entertaining i managed to get through the whole thing but i came away thinking this movie is ready for a remake i would love to see a remake of the time machine with today's technology apparently there was a movie called the time guy machine pierce. that came out with guy pierce and it it has really low numbers on rotten tomatoes yeah um i was just gonna so, ask if 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 there was a, a, a remake it was. of it, because I... I don't know if it was a remake or a sequel, I but... hadn't heard. There, yeah. there, it was a remake, and it was... They they really they missed the whole concept. I mean, he still gets on, he sees stuff happening in time, yeah. and then the way he, he gets knocked out, and that's why he goes all the way into the future, and then yeah. decides... Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't work. Yeah. It doesn't was, make sense. One of the reasons, and this is so crazy, one of the reasons that he went so far into the future in the 1960 version is lava is coming his way, threatening oh, to yeah. destroy the time machine. He hops in. He escapes in the nick of time by going forward. But apparently the lava formed a mountain Mount. around his yeah. time machine, and he had to wait for the mountain to decay. Whoa. So that's one of the reasons he went so far in the future, was waiting for erosion to remove the mountain around him <laughs> until he could step out of his time machine again. And I'm like, that's that's a... That's a, a cop out of uh, not showing the yeah. the evolution of human beings for several hundred thousand years, but I really actually liked. I, I know that you said the cars were being pushed by lava and it was terrible. <laughs> There's a scene there, and I wasn't really prepared for it. I figured that he was going to go back in time or something like that. But the scene that I really loved is when is when he's sitting in it, and around him he's got the uh, he, he's got. The, the, the building falls apart and then across the street. And so you see that being de deconstructed yeah. and then across the street, you see the, the clothes change in the window. And I really liked that. Oh, I, it I wasn't enjoyed a that special too. effect and, and there were cheesy things, but um, to be sure about it, but I actually really liked that fast forward motion type of thing. Oh, and yeah. Having him look around and having that thing build up around him as a kid. I mean, I got, I got chills. I was like, whoa, well, how does he get out of this? And then he yeah. had to wait for it to come back down. Yeah. But the people in the future, I mean, what's her name, Mimia? I mean, she's yeah. she's obviously beautiful. And that was all her that. very first acting role ever. And she's yeah. just a yeah, teenager or something like that. And she's yeah. smoking hot. Um, and then she does wind up in the black hole, and she's still smoking hot. But um, <laughs> I just had to put that in there. But anyway, uh, it's a cool, I think it's a cool show. And when I was a kid, I wasn't terribly... I probably saw it on a Saturday afternoon where they had 800 commercials because they knew they had you, right? Yeah, yeah. But um, I, I, I actually really quite enjoyed it, and uh, it, it, it for the longest time that was the gold standard for me. I hadn't seen anything yeah. until probably Back to the Future from from the 1960s. Show me another time travel movie that made sense. 
that a kid could see yeah. until 85. And it was high time to me yeah. for something to be made by then. And then there, here comes this DeLorean that's a time machine and he couldn't think of. Yeah. And I was, what, what did it come, 85, right? Yeah. I was yeah. 14. I was saving up for a car. It couldn't have been a cooler car. I just was like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, this yeah. Is cool. Now, my question about the time machine, again, time travel movies do this to you. Did it have some sort of protective bubble? Because there were several times throughout the movie where it should have been destroyed. It but somehow it protect yeah, it protected him from lava and other dangers and buildings being destroyed around him and built around him and all this other in the, stuff. In the in the re in the remake in the remake they address that. It's a, it creates like a, a, a chrono sorry, I'm gonna put you can put the word chrono in front of anything. Chrono burger. You know, it's it's a, it's a chrono field. <laughs> mm-hmm. So this way even Jeremy Irons, who's the antagonist the kind of like when he falls when the guy Pierce pushes him out of the field you see him age dramatic. You oh, see the effects. Interesting. So okay. they they treat it as it's a field. Okay. Right around the yeah. Like immediately. They started. never directly addressed it in the 1960 version, but clearly there was something going on because yeah. it otherwise protected the lava, him. Throughout. Otherwise, the lava would just melt him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just, what? And then the the funny thing is too is early in the film he's like, well, I think you can only go forward. I don't know if you can go backwards. So he doesn't even know if he could return to his original time. But then at the end of or toward the end of his adventure in the future, he just goes. And pulls the stick back, comes back to present day. It's like, well, apparently you didn't test that part of it, but that seems to be a feature. Yeah. But so again, the bottom line is, I would love to see this movie remade using today's technology, where you can actually see the future of high rises being built and destroyed and rebuilt. Yeah. And I would love to see a new take. I, on I that. think there's a few movies on our list that could be miniseries. One of them is Somewhere in Time with a better ending. I yeah. just, I just think that yeah. would be so cool to flesh out the characters better. Yeah. But yeah. I also like the idea of having that one just done better and maybe a part one and a part two. Yeah. Um, yeah, where maybe Dune he stops is, along the way. The new Dune is so much cooler than the original Dune because yeah. there's so right. much source material. Yep. Yeah. So many, so many rabbit holes to go down. Um, some other movies I just wanted to throw out quickly without getting into deep discussion, but I actually enjoyed Men in Three or Men in Black Three. Uh, that had a time travel element where uh, you see a young Will Smith, uh, and then they explain why he was brought into the Men in Black program. Um, and but not Will Smith. You mean uh, Tommy Lee Jones? Tommy Lee with Jones. Josh Brolin. Well, y- yeah, but oh, you see the young boy. You see a young Will Smith. Yeah. and and Tommy Lee Jones' character vows to be his protector. Yeah. and basically uh, adopts the okay. young Will Smith into the program. Nice. Yeah, yeah cool. and so I really enjoyed it. I I really love the whole Men in Black trilogy. Um, but that was a fun uh take on time travel. Uh, I think. Oh, here's what I wanted to mention real quick. Uh. Is Demolition Man a time travel movie? Oh. Uh, Stallone is a cop in uh, yes. 19... The movie came out in 1993. The, the movie is initially set in 1996. He's falsely accused of a crime. He's put into this chirogenic freeze. And uh, because of uh, the bad guy played by Wesley Snipes, he's thawed in 2032. So he's brought from his slumber into the future 2032 does that constitute a time travel movie? well there's a bunch of things like that then i don't call it time travel but i mean look aliens part two right that's then that's time travel yeah that's she falls a asleep into same the future, thing cryogenic yeah, yeah. type of oh, thing yeah. so you can't go back yeah. i don't i don't think it is a, a classic one if you can yeah. only go forward and you can't go back then it's yeah. not time traveling it's time it's you just dumped it yeah. in some spot. Yeah. I mean, it's it's an excuse to have fun speculating what the future might hold with the clamshell toilet paper thing, and and uh, yep. every time you swear, you you're issued a fine. So it's it is <laughs> like an that. opportunity to speculate what the future might hold. So yeah, Pepsi I, wins the uh, what is it? Yeah, Pepsi wins the restaurant Taco wars. Bell. Yeah, Taco, Taco Bell. Bell. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with George. I wouldn't go with uh, time travel because if that is that the case, Shawshank Redemption when when they get out, it's like, oh, the world has changed since I've been in prison. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know what all these things are, you know. Yeah. Or yeah. the mummy. You know, the mummy comes on. It's like, what 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 is happening right now? What? Yeah. Are Men uh, can fly. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> right. I don't know. Right. I guess in a sense, it is. Time travel because psychologically there's the impact. It's it's almost of like seeing the future. Of seeing the future. Yeah, yeah. It's that oh everything's changed and we're all going to live through my reactions on yeah. how everything's changed. You know what? And when you think about it, if you if you really break down movies into very basic sub genres, probably the most 
popular, successful subgenre of all time is the fish out of water. Yeah. Taking someone out of their yes. norm, under out of their comfort zone, and thrusting them into an environment where they're unfamiliar with uh, the, the societal norms. That's probably the most popular genre of, of all movies. I can hear Sir Al Guinness, you know, from a certain point of view. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> you wake up from a coma from a certain point of view, you have traveled into the future. <laughs> that's right. So, all right, that's pretty much my list. Uh, Nick, is there any time travel movies that jump out at you that you feel that uh, we need to discuss in the next 10 minutes or so? No, I mean, the ones, we covered pretty much everyone that was on my top 10. I think I would be surprised if, I mean, look, I had the source code was one of them. Uh, it's Jake Gyllenhaal. Yeah, and, uh, never saw that one. Yeah, it's it, it's he keeps reliving eight minutes. You know, they always have to put a very finite amount of time. You go back <laughs> in time for eight minutes to try and stop a disaster. Okay. There was a movie called Deja Vu with Denzel Washington, mm. and uh, uh, it, it's the same concept: go back in time to stop the government invented time travel to go back in time. You can go back four days to try and stop a major incident. Yeah. So stuff like that. It's an entertaining movie, but nothing that I would say it's gonna. End up in on Mount Rushmore. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, my my, those about it. Everything like Edge, Edge of Tomorrow, I enjoyed. I, I'd put that up there. Back to the Future, obviously. Star Trek Four. Yeah. So I'm good. I've actually had a lot of fun the past weekend, past week or so, watching and rewatching these time travel movies. It's kind of fun when you stay within a genre and you watch different interpretations of movies that fall under that genre. It's a lot of fun revisiting that and seeing the different unique takes andrew any time travel movies you want to throw uh, out george just briefly mentioned earlier a movie called about time with Domhnall gleason and rachel mcadams yep oh man 2013 so, i'm not familiar with that one at all excellent I love that one it's a great excellent film. i saw it in the theater with my fiance at the time and her russian roommate <laughs> and i i it was a tearjerker at the end i'm not going to Spoil it, but hmm. did you see it, Nick? Yeah. Okay. It's beautifully done. Oh my it's gosh! So well done. Look that one up. First time you, anyone probably has ever seen Margot Robbie on the screen. Interesting. Twenty thirteen. Okay. Uh, also Vanessa Kirby, who has been in the last, was the last two Mission Impossible movies. Yeah. And she was on The Crown, that Netflix yeah. movie or show. Anyway, excellent movie. Um, it's it's a romantic comedy. So it's you can't really take it seriously except for like the last ten minutes. Mm -hmm. um, what's the the British actor who plays his dad, Bill Nighy? Bill, Nigh Bill Nighy. Nighy. I love that. Oh movie. my gosh! It's, I I teared up at the end, and hmm. when we were rocking out the theater, I'm like, I'm sorry, uh, my uh, my allergies are acting <laughs> yeah. up. I I was seriously, I had tears in my eyes. Allergies? Wow. It's February. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that that that's movie a hit that's me a good. future topic for our podcast. Are the tear jerkers? Oh, right? I gotta, oh, oh I can, yes. I can yeah. Come we got to go down that road. Easy. You know, for a long time, people were talking about about time versus time traveler's wife, and about time keeps. Winning. Oh yeah, that didn't come out, uh, or that didn't come up today. But that's another one. Yeah, um, um, and then and then just to briefly talk about uh, the Woody Allen movie Midnight in Paris. With uh, is that Owen a time Wilson? travel movie? I thought you were going to say Sleepers, which is oh, it's similar. Oh, <laughs> Sleepers is another one. Yeah, fall asleep 70s. and wake and up later. Yeah. 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 Uh, what's uh, Midnight in Paris? How's it, it there? It takes time? place in the present day. Woody Allen, also with Rachel McAdams, is mm -hmm. his wife and her parents. They they're Americans traveling to Paris, and he plays the typical Woody Allen type guy, where he's just kind of disenfranchised with everything, not really happy with his in his marriage. And I don't remember exactly how it happens. I think he gets into a car and steps out, and then he ends up in the night, is it the twenties. <laughs> yeah, I think. And he oh, talks to so Ernest cool. Hemingway. He talks to Salvador Dali. I have no idea. It's probably the last great Woody Allen movie. It came out in wow. twenty eleven. Oh, that that There's might no. actually excellent. be true. Yeah, excellent, 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 true. excellent wow. movie. And then also he's got on the list here, Time Bandits. Also, oh yes, Terry Gilliam. Oh, Terry yeah, Gilliam, yeah. I need like. It. And uh, I saw I, that once or twice when I was younger. I I, I, I only I actually only saw the first half of it. I've never seen the full movie, um, so I can't talk a lot about it. But I, from what I saw, I remember liking. It, so. yeah. yeah, George, any? Uh, no, those are mine. I've, I've talked enough. Thank you. <laughs> I uh, I did want to throw out real quick. Uh, I mentioned that I wrote a short story when I was in my late teens, early twenties, and. My concept is linear time where anything that happens in the past affects what we experience today. And uh, I write a story about a character who writes time travel novels 
which are enormously successful, which allows him to fund his time travel experiments. And he, he uh, is very close to cracking the code. Uh, there's, it's not a, if I were to do it as a short film, it wouldn't be very effects heavy. It's more about philosophy and stuff. But one of these days, I'm going to grab a camera. Maybe when our Wildwood Film Festival rolls around, I'll shoot my little time travel story. But um, there I is a love movie the topic. kind of like that that we forgot to ma- mention. It's a found footage kind of a time travel with a camera, and it's the teenagers. I know what you're and talking about. And it's in the basin. And, and, they and develop the father, powers uh, from an alien oh, technology that, or maybe something. Maybe that's it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, it was really confusing. But anyway, that was, <laughs> that was kind of cool to watch, too. Yeah. All right. Um, like I said, this is the longest podcast we've done, but it was such a great topic. One of my favorite This is topics. part one. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, all right. I mean, if it was TV, we'd be Part we'd one have, of ten. We'll be back with 30 more titles. <laughs> yeah. We could have done, literally, we could have done the last two hours just on Back to the Future. Oh, yeah. oh Easily. I know. Absolutely. The I mean, impact, the we influence. didn't talk about Biff in the future and the cars. And, <laughs> and when they right. eventually reboot it starring Tom Holland, who knows? Well, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> no, no, no. Even though they took a movie out of it. I for a second. I did. As long as as long as uh, Bob Gale is alive, he says he's not going to allow any sort of remake. But we'll see. All right, let's uh, wrap things up, guys. That was a great discussion. I really Thank enjoyed you that. Absolutely, be here. so and, fun. And uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks, and we'll leave you with this. Come to the movies, watch Charlie Chaplin, and put some sunshine into your day. Forget the hard times Come to the movies And try to laugh your troubles away